I would also like to let you know that we have um, 118 people on the line waiting and I'm gonna bring them right on right now. Can you guys see my slide? Yes, Fred, we can. Yes. Uh, Sheila, is it okay to bring in people now? Yes, yes, we can now bring in people. I could just send a little text that we are starting in one minute. <clears throat> Recording. Welcome everybody. We will be starting in approximately one minute. Thank you so much to those who've just joined us. And uh, I guess we should begin by uh, sending uh, our sincere apologies for uh, the situation we had last week um, and the lack of advanced announcement. We are grateful that you've still been able to join with us today. And for that reason, and for your constant participation, we would like to send a word of gratitude also for your support um, in this mission. So once again, thank you all. And we will be starting in approximately 30 seconds. Just so you know, this session is being live streamed on YouTube. And I would like to request one of my colleagues uh, uh, from uh, if Akara to kindly share the link on YouTube on a, on this chat box on how to access the YouTube channel. I can see there's a little line on the slide there. Uh, I guess this is from someone's computer. We have to check which one. So what I'm going to do is discontinue the sharing and restart it uh, real quick. Please bear with us.
So this is good. We kindly request all participants to please mute your microphone. Um, our main speakers will stay on video. Uh, the rest, we will request that um, you mute your microphone. Occasionally, we might request a few people to jump in as well. And uh, in that case, we would ask you to turn on your video. Shayla, can we just confirm the sounds? The sounds are good for everybody? Um, yep. So why don't we invite our experts on video then real quick? Um, then we can start. So we already have 135 people online. Thank you so much for uh, your participation. And uh, we will start in 10 seconds. Again, feel free to share as many questions as you want on the chat box. My colleague Shayla and myself will try our level best to uh, elevate these questions for discussion with our experts today. We have with us uh, Professor Sylvie Manguin, and we have uh, Professor Indra uh, from Malaysia, Indra Vitilingam. We have uh, Professor Yasmin Rubio Palis, who is a constant participant in the master classes actually uh, from Latin America. This is great. Uh, um, Yasmin, you have to represent all the countries uh, in that part. So instead of Venezuela, we'll just say uh, uh, America. And then uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Lizette Kokomoy from South Africa. And we have Professor Therapab from uh, Thailand. We hope at some point that we will hear uh, from uh, um, uh, Brenny is, is uh, bogged down. We will hear from Professor Marian Sinka from Imperial at some point as well. Uh, I would like us to begin now. So, welcome everybody. Okay. And again, just so you know, this um, masterclass is being streamed live on YouTube. Thank you so much to my colleagues if you are able to share the link already to that. Shayla, please, let's start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have an exciting masterclass on vectors of Asia, Africa, um, America. So we are going to look at the differences between all these vectors and what um, really drives transmission in the different continents. We are also going to look specifically at the situation in Venezuela and why it is um, unique. Uh, we will also find some time to look at the issues around receival transmission. We want to understand um, from our expert really well what um, residual transmission is all about. Um, so welcome to our masterclass and we hope we are hoping for a fruitful discussion today. Fred Ross. Thank you. I guess there's no better place to begin than this analysis done in 2004 um, uh, by Anthony Kizetsky and colleagues. And I know that our experts today um, Sylvie, uh, Yasmin, um, you guys have looked at this in particular in, in the exercises that you've done in recent years uh, together with Marian Sinker and others updating the maps of dominant malaria vectors. But we would like to begin with this for two reasons. One, because we find it a, a, a very, very comprehensive analysis of, or rather not complex, but an, an interesting analysis of why malaria transmission systems vary in different continents. Uh, the analysis there included, of course, uh, a representation of the different malaria vectors in different parts of the world. Many of them are complexes there, but they are presented as singular. But then they also looked at different variables. They looked at the, I'm, I'm just gonna move 
one, 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 one slide earlier, they, look, they looked at, on, as you can see on the left side there, they looked at the biology of these vectors and how this interacts with climatic factors, the duration of transmission settings, and essentially created what they refer to as an index of malaria transmission. On this basis, they've made some conclusions of why malaria transmission in Africa is a lot more intense than you have elsewhere. Now, I guess the best place to begin here with, with our experts is usually when people discuss why malaria is difficult to control in Africa, you know, you have references about why can't we do what was done in the US or what was done in China or what was done elsewhere. To what extent, and I will send this question to Sylvie uh, to begin with, to what extent do you think the arguments about malaria control and the challenges in Africa, to what extent do you think these arguments miss the simple fact that the biology of malaria transmission in the continent is a lot more intense than it is elsewhere? Back to you, Sylvia. That, that's um, a tricky... No, 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 no bye. Sorry? Long bow, long bow. I've muted whatever that was. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a very uh, tricky question, uh, but um, uh, what uh, uh, what is happening is that the, the malaria vectors in, in Africa are uh, uh, a lot better than uh, in other continent. And what I mean is that uh, they, uh, these vectors, um, Anopheles gambier uh, in particular, um, is very um, anthropophilic, so very closely related to, to humans. And, um, and also the, uh, this mosquito is breeding uh, next to the, uh, to the villages, to the settlement of humans. And uh, so these, um, uh, these facts, these uh, parameters are um, making this mosquito quite, uh, quite efficient compared to uh, 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 vectors in other continents, which are more uh, adaptable, more flexible. They, they can uh, bite on animals, on humans, uh, even though we have uh, anthropophilic uh, um, malaria vectors on all continents, but uh, really uh, if there is one um, um, extremely powerful uh, malaria vector in the world, it's, uh, they, they are, I mean, it's Anopheles gambier, Anopheles funestus, and they both are on uh, the African continent. So, so when people say that um, Africa should adopt the approaches that have been that have worked elsewhere. Do you think that's a realistic um, um, expression, given the differences? Uh, I mean, it's uh, it, it's difficult to uh, eradicate or eliminate or even reduce um, uh, a vector such as Anopheles gambier because it, it can breed pretty much uh, everywhere. So what has been applied uh, in, uh, in Europe, in the state or in temp temperate uh, uh, countries has nothing to do with uh, tropical countries uh, at one point. And, uh, and in Africa, it's even uh, more complicated due to the, the, this uh, uh, close um, um, habitat of the, the mosquito with, with human uh, settlement. So it, it's, it's quite complicated to avoid um, any uh, breeding site uh, after a, a big rain, for example, a gam gambier will, will breed uh, easily everywhere in a very small pool. So it, it's, uh, it will be uh, very complicated to uh, uh, reduce the density of the of this mosquito, but um, I'm sure that Lizette has uh, yeah. uh, more to, to say about uh, this African uh, vec malaria vectors. 
I would like to actually bring in uh, uh, Professor Lizette here as well. Um, Lizette, if, if, if you don't mind, I mean, you track a lot the malaria vectors in the continent, and we hear all these arguments all the time about the challenges of malaria control in Africa versus the challenges of malaria control elsewhere. Uh, we have successes such as has happened with you know, China. We're not gonna discuss that today. What is your take? on the adoption of technologies such as indoor residual spray, um, 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 mass drug administration, uh, environmental management, improved housing, interventions that appear to have worked very well elsewhere. How would we adapt this one so that they work effectively in the African continent, given the, the differences as expressed in this analysis. Lizette. Yeah, so I can, I can only iterate what um, Sylvie just discussed. I, I think Africa sits with a very complex mosquito biology, lots of species um, able to adapt their breeding habitats to make them very successful in surviving. And they've done this for decades now. So I think all these new interventions are all good and the more the better tools we have and the more tools we have in our toolbox, the better success we will have. But I think what works in one country might not necessarily work in another country. Um, and it's largely to do with the biology of the species, the environment. You have social aspects you've got to look at, you've got to look at political aspects. So I think it's extremely complex to say it worked here and it should work here. So I think we need to take that into consideration. Over Thank you. Thank you. Sheila, please. Yeah, thank you, Fredros. Uh, so, Professor Lizetti, there's this phenomenon of human blood index. Um, mosquitoes prefer human blood. How important is this to malaria transmission intensity in both um, Asia and Africa? I think it's vital. If you have a mosquito that prefers 80, 90% to feed on animals, then the risk of actually picking up malaria for that mosquito on its first blood meal and then transmitting it back to humans are reduced. So if you have a species that's highly human specific, so it feeds strictly on humans, doesn't like a cow, doesn't like dogs or anything else, then that mosquito will do everything in its power to get a blood meal. If you sleep under a bed net, the mosquito will try and catch you when you're outside of a bed net. Um, and if you're outside and there's nobody else inside, the vector might well go outside and look for a blood meal. Because I think it's a female's main drive in life is to find a, a blood meal and reproduce. And I think they do this very successfully. And these females do it every two or three days. So their sensory, their olfactory to find a host for their survival are very specialized. And I, I think We've started touching some of these specialities that mosquitoes have, but I think there's a lot, it's almost like an iceberg under the sea. I think we started to understand some of it, but there's a lot under the sea that we don't understand yet of these mosquitoes. Um, and every time we think, oh, we got you, now we're gonna kill you, then they come with a sideline and they just do something else. And I think it's part of the complexities and why it's so difficult to eliminate this disease. Yeah, thank you, Professor. So can we say then that the vectors of Sub-Saharan Africa have, have actually adapted to being very, very efficient in transmitting parasites, of course, in comparison to the ones in Asia? For sure. I, I think it's their life mission to, to transmit. And because there's so many species, it makes your control interventions a lot more difficult. We, in, in other countries where you might have fewer main vectors, it's a lot easier to, to actually get a lid on your malaria transmission. But when you have so many species that are quite efficient in, in transmitting, then you have to have an approach to target almost each, every single species. And that adds to the complexity that we, we have to deal with, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Professor. So um, I think we'll be looking at why a vector is deemed efficient. Uh, but meanwhile, back to you, Fred Bruce. Thank you. Complexity, uh, complexity, complexity. This is nice. I mean, Lizette, my colleague, uh, Professor Jerry Klein, 
uh, took the maps from Anthony Kitweski, extracted uh, the human blood indices, and, and say to my colleague Alex and, and myself to, to, to draw maps with just the human blood indices. And this is, this is what came up. Um, uh, that's the map that you see there. It's exactly the same map, except now it represents the HBI the human blood index. What you see here is the redness or the, the intensity of, 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 of HBI uh, um, indices is, is strongest um, um, in Africa. So there's this a very good correlation uh, with what you're saying. We would like to, to get a comment from you. Uh, I know you've, you've touched on this quite, quite a bit, but a comment from you on how this phenomenon should in, inform malaria control in different parts of the world. Yeah, I think that what this tells me is that the main thing you've got to do is prevent the mosquito from feeding on humans. And you must do this in any way possible and use all the tools to your ability. Um, Mass drug administration, of course, you mentioned that is, is, is great. Um, the challenge might be how to get a whole population um, into that. So I, I don't see that as a standalone mechanism, neither do I see IRS as a standalone mechanism. Um, these things all need to work almost like an orchestra. Every person in an orchestra pray, plays a vital role and it, it goes with malaria transmission. If you have mosquitoes that feed on humans, you want to have your whole orchestra working together and fine tune everything so that you have a great sympathy symphony at the end. And that includes involving your social scientists, involving your, your community, um, your environmental um, officers. So it's, it's not a very easy thing, I think, to put together um, because the skills are sometimes missing. So it is a challenge. Um, but how having this information sort of guides us what we should do and where our efforts also should go towards. Thank you. It would be nice to, to, to hear from uh, uh, Professor Yasmin uh, and uh, Professor Indra a little bit about, I mean, the situation in the Americas, Yasmin says we shouldn't say the Americas, but uh, in, 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 um, in South America, is it Central America, is very similar to, to, um, uh, to several parts of Southeast Asia. It would be nice to hear very briefly from Yasmin and then from Indra, uh, similar a response and how a reflection similar to what Lizette was giving on how the human blood indices, the preferences of the different mosquitoes to humans, how that has informed or should inform malaria control in their different parts of the world. We start with Yasmin. Uh, hi, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, looking at this map, it gives me the impression that um, it's kind of bias because it depends actually on the effort on the amount of publications that have been done on human blood indices. When you check on the studies in the America for the human blood index, there are very few, very few studies. And uh, of course it, uh, it depends on where the samples were taken. I mean, if you were collecting your mosquitoes in an area where you don't have uh, cattle around or other domestic uh, animals, I mean, your results would be different. So I, I wouldn't consider this map to be highly accurate since, uh, um, I mean, going back into my hard disk, checking on the available literature on human blood indices in, um, in countries like in Mexico, where there were a lot of studies done, Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, etc. I mean, it's really unrealistic when you see that uh, Argentina or Bolivia and Brazil have the same amount of, of the same uh, range of human blood indicates. I mean, that is some, um, I wouldn't consider that. So sorry for that. I don't have more to say because it's uh, kind of biased. In my experience, uh, in uh, uh, it's estimating human blood indices, I have said in a, rural areas where there were a lot of uh, cattle and other animals around houses, even though the species tend to bite on humans. But it varies on the amount of cattle that were around the villages. 
because I took the I took the trouble to go and count them and ask the people how many cattle they have, how many chicks, how many uh, donkeys, horses, etc. And um, and I said that for some species they really do tend to go and bite on humans, but it depends. I mean, if they found before entering the house there is a dog around, they just go and bite on the hat, on the dog. So. The, these mosquitoes are really opportunistic. I mean, they feed on whatever is available. That's before we go to Indra. That's a, a very important, uh, two important points you raised there. One is the issue of sampling bias, where um, you know scientists actually collect the data, and whether they design these studies in a way that best captures the diversity of the hosts. The, the, the second issue uh, um, you express there is host availability itself. Uh, and I, I can see uh, a text there from Professor De, uh, uh, Charlwood um, with some comments on how the human blood index studies can be improved to better capture this host availability. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for, for bringing that into, the, into consideration. I think it's, it's, it's a, a, a lesson that I would ask many of my colleagues on the call here to take uh, seriously as well. Let's go to Indra, please. Um, thank you, Fred. I actually uh, concur with what Jasmine has said, because I think in this part, uh, in the Southeast Asia, especially in Malaysia, there's very little work that has been done on blood meal analysis. And before, when I was working on human malaria, like we were so used to collecting mosquitoes coming to bite human, and we basically, based all our work on it. But now that I work on simian malaria and I'm not allowed to use monkey baited trap. So now I want to see whether my mosquitoes are attracted to human or to monkeys. And to tell you, I have a great problem collecting resting mosquitoes. I do not, wear, I do not know where the mosquitoes are resting. I have tried using various uh, suction apparatus to collect resting mosquitoes, but we are not successful. So we have sort of like uh, modified, uh, doing some lab experiments and we have modified, and now we have found a way where we can use those mosquitoes to see uh, the blood meal, whether we can still uh, do blood meal analysis on those, and we are having some success. So soon, at least we will be able to publish some data to show whether the mosquitoes are feeding more on human, on monkeys, or on other animals. That has always been our problem. We cannot use light traps to collect our Anopheles mosquitoes like they can do in Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, this is, these are really, really important points. I think, I don't know about you, Shayla, but I, I think that the, the two issues, the, the sampling, you know, where do we catch, what are we using to catch mosquitoes and so on. I can see on the chat, a lot of people agree with the sentiments from both uh, Yasmin and Indra. Uh, back to you, Shayla. Yeah, thank you, Fred. So uh, I, I think um, the, next, the next question is sort of probably to all our panelists maybe, but we'll start with Professor Kirap. Um, so what are the main variations between the continents in terms of the transmission dynamics? What is really influencing transmission across the three continents? Please, um, Professor Kirap. <laughs> I hope we are pronouncing it correctly. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, Shala. <clears throat> I think uh, this is a um, is very good question. As, as you can see from uh, what we have discussed, uh, different continent, but uh, different uh, intensity of uh, this transmission. <clears throat> In uh, talking about Thailand, the, the big problem of the country in this area, in, the, in this area, or in greater Mekong sub regions, uh, what we what we have uh, you know there's some difficulty in collect mosquito. That what uh, Indra has mentioned. Sometimes not very easy to get uh, two or three mosquito. You have to spend uh, many nights. Uh, but you know if you go to uh, in the uh, in the uh, okay, say the serious uh, uh, Cases like along the border between the country Thai Cambodia or Thai uh, Malaysia, this is the one that you can maybe you can collect mosquito, but you have to go in the in the in the uh, specific 
uh, seasons. For example, the vector in this area mostly related to the forest. But uh, what you can see from another country, maybe from India, this is an urban species, or in Africa, they are different. This is one variation that you that that we found very little or very uh, low density that, that we can find in the country in, 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 in Asia compared to another continent. And the second one, I think the human, <clears throat> the human occupation, most most problem in in this country, in Asian country, Soviet Asian country, country the uh, human occupation related to the uh, the forest who got malaria, not in the city or not in town. So I think these two things, uh, possible density, uh, human behavior or human uh, occupation could be the variation that occur in different continents. I don't know if I answer your questions. Sierra. Yes, thank you very much. You did. The others can add. Sylvie, would you like yes, to add on? If I can uh, uh, say something yes, um, additional is that um, uh, beside what uh, Professor Tirapap said, which is uh, totally uh, uh, true, uh, there is also the, the prevalence of the plasmodium, which is quite different from one continent to, to the next. So um, uh, Africa uh, has a majority of uh, plasmodium falciparum, and uh, that's why the, this continent is really uh, has uh, the, the highest burden of malaria. Uh, as well as um, uh, Papua New Guinea, which is another uh, part of um, uh, uh, the world that is really um, strongly hit by malaria. We don't speak so much about this, uh, uh, this part of the world because uh, not many uh, studies have been done, but, um, but people uh, pay a very high price uh, um, towards malaria. So, um, so falciparum is mainly on the African continent. Uh, in Asia, we have um, all four, uh, five even uh, species of plasmodium, but um, mainly um, nearly half and half. I mean, depends on the country, but um, viva, plasmodium vivax and plasmodium falciparum are both uh, occurring a, a, a good percentage in, uh, in Asia. And on the uh, American continent, uh, there is um, uh, in the Amazon, uh, uh, mainly in um, Central America, it's mainly uh, Plasmodium vivax, uh, and in some parts, uh, Plasmodium falciparum. So, of course, the, the prevalence of the Plasmodium will make a big difference from one continent to, to the next. And, and also the, um, the, the poverty of the, the population is also another very important um, factor um, because we know that malaria is uh, strongly uh, linked to poverty. So where, where a country um, has very poor population, uh, malaria will, uh, will expand and will, um, uh, will, do, will do well, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you, Professor Silvi. Fred? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Silvi, uh, actually also for bringing in this additional uh, idea. So we started the conversation by looking at the biology of the mosquitoes and climate. And, and you bring in the issues of uh, human, um, uh, um, human development, you know, poverty uh, and, and all that, and also the parasite side. And uh, before we proceed, actually, I would just like to um, uh, raise this up and inform, I don't know if you can see it without uh, an idea, maybe you'll see it, um, the background. Um, I will remove. I, I know this just, book. <laughs> I know, but but I, actually I think I think it's important for, um, I'll just remove the background not for, for now to show that for our colleagues on the, on the master class, this is the biodiversity of malaria in the wild. It's a, a, a publication edited by Sylvie herself and Pierre Carnaval and, and others. Uh, and, and we would like 
but it's something that we would highly recommend uh, for understanding the differences uh, across um, uh, multiple continents. This is a uh, major um, book that was uh, written by Jean Moucher, and uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, his, um, uh, his contribution because he has been really uh, a great uh, person working on malaria, and I learned so much from him. So this this book uh, is uh, uh, coming from him mainly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But as we go on. Uh, in the, the slide that we, we show here now, uh, many of you on the call have contributed to this. And, and I would like actually to kindly invite Marianne Sinka, who is the first author of this paper, has done immense amount of work, depending on available, uh, 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 exploiting available advancements, recent advancements to create uh, these updated maps of major malaria vectors. Uh, just for a bit to form the basis of the next step of our discussion, Marian, if you can come in right now to just explain the motivation, what was the motivation behind this compilation and, and how you guys worked depended on existing improvements or advancements in mapping to create this and why it's important going forward. Uh, Marian, please. Um, hello. Well, thank you for um, inviting me to, to join in. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be able to share with um, with the experts that you have on your panel, all of all of whom um, played a major role in the work that, and the maps that you see. Without them, they wouldn't have happened at all. Um, so what we wanted to do was basically uh, there, there were maps, previous maps that existed um, based on expert opinion, based on point data. Basically, when you have an occurrence where someone's reported that a mosquito exists in a certain place and they kind of give the coordinates. Um, but we wanted to try and apply some more kind of evidence-based uh, methods to try and get a little bit more information out of these data and try and work out if we could um, distinguish where different species were found, um, where they overlap, um, and what are, were the underlying um, conditions and environments that, that actually caused these species to have certain limits. Um, and so we spent, the project, uh, the initial project was three years, um, and we spent those three years gathering together as much information as we could from the published literature. So these basically this is all the work that everyone else was doing, all the, all the people on the ground, um, every time they pu published a paper and reported uh, the occurrence of a mosquito, um, we would take that information, put it into a database, and then we applied some um, spatial modelling and um, and uh, overlay that with some environmental conditions, so rainfall levels, temperature, and so on, and predicted and tried to predict where the different species were, um, and 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 then accompanying that with um, a summary of the bionomics. And as I said, this is this is where you know, other than kind of actually um, truth checking the, the maps that we created with our experts, um, the experts um, really brought their knowledge of how the different mosquitoes behave. And we were able to include that and that's incredibly relevant and as we know from what we've just been speaking about um, the different behaviors of the mosquitoes very much affect how well they transmit um, and you know that's why we have certain levels of transmission in Africa because of the mosquito species that you have so knowing where they are and how they behave and trying to combine those that's you know that that's what we we try to do. Uh, Marin before you you go in your opinion what do you think are the gaps in this? I mean, you, you acknowledge that even though this is currently the most comprehensive uh, 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 compilation of malaria vectors around the world, you, you acknowledge that there's still a lot of gaps. Uh, in your opinion, what are some of these gaps? Um, so, well, so first of all, these, these, these maps are actually already, you know, they're, they're pretty out of date and they do need to be updated. Um, and... I would say the, the major gaps um, that I that we have actually already tried to deal with is in um, in Asia because in Asia we, we there is a very complicated vector community. You have lots of species complexes. You've got lots of different species. I, I suspect it's because um, there's not those dominant those truly dominant vectors like Gambi and Fenestus. You're looking at all the kind of other ones, and it's, there's there's a lot of complexity there, and there's a lot of difficulty in trying to identify the species, and a lots of complexity in the behaviour. And we had we didn't actually cover that um, in our publications. 
Um, so we have revisited that uh, and we have tried to recreate uh, or, or, or um, create some maps so that we include the species complexes and the sibling species from, from which weren't included in the original. Um, and, and also the, the very clear gaps is the fact that there is just a lot of missing data for many species. Um, and, um, and obviously there, there are biases, um, again, we've, we've already mentioned biases in how the data are collected. So we can only do what we can do with the data, but we also have to be aware that those data are being collected by entomologists rather, so there's kind of the, the, uh, the location of an entomologist rather than the location of a mosquito. So we have to kind of consider that in all our uh, analyses yeah. as well. But yeah, basically what's going on in Asia, um, it, it, that's where there is a major gap, I would say. Uh, Were well, you just about to suggest that entomologists are not very good at field data collection? No way, no. That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, that's the best of the entomologists really can't, really can't get to. <laughs> all right, all right, okay. So uh, on that note, uh, uh, before I hand this back to Shayla, I'm just going to push this to uh, Professor Therapap and Indra. Uh, Marian mentioned Asia and India as having this difficulty with species complexes, limited data. Talk to us about that. Let's start with uh, Professor Therapa and then, and then Indra. A, a little more detail about these complexities uh, 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 and, and why it makes malaria control there a little more difficult than elsewhere. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I, I think it's true that what uh, Marianne mentioned in, in this region in Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, uh, we got uh, the complex of the, the mosquito, at least at least uh, three complex, uh, Dyrus, Minimus, and Macuratus. And the problem of the Asia, uh, never, I think uh, several places, they, they have no facility to uh, identify the, the species. For example, in, in, in Thailand, I think, uh, I think a few lab, can be able to identify mosquito species. So this is very important because uh, uh, different, di different species have different, that have unique characteristics. For, for example, within the Minimus complex, there are two species, at least in, in this region, Minimus and Harrisoni. So if, if, if we don't know which one is Minimus, which one is Harrisoni, so this means nothing. So you cannot get the correct uh, uh, species. You cannot get the correct uh, characteristic. For example, uh, minimus prefer biting indoor or outdoor. Another uh, 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 biting outdoor and mostly on on the animal. So this is this is quite important for the. I think, I think the first thing that you have to do is you have to to have a correct species identification. But the gap is. Uh, not too many labs can do this. Uh, I don't know, it, it may be a uh, few labs from Cambodia and few labs from Vietnam, but if, if we can do this more and more, I think it, we will get, well, it's very solid information about the species complex in this region. Uh, may I add something? Yeah, please. Uh, okay, so yeah, in Asia, um, compared to the, the, the rest of the world, there are uh, half of the uh, species complex occur in Asia. So in, in total, there are 28 uh, species, uh, Anopheles species complex in the world, 14 of, of them are occurring in Asia. So that gives you the, the range a little bit of the, this complexity in Asia. Um, so uh, when you have a, a complex of uh, Anopheles species, that means that some of the species will, will have no impact in malaria transmission. They are not vectors. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, do you have very good, very uh, important malaria vectors and everything in between. So if you decide, if you collect mosquitoes and uh, you say, well, this is Anopheles dirus, for example, but this is uh, Census lato. I mean, it's a dirus, but within dirus, you have eight species and eight species from major vector to non-vectors. So if you don't use a PCR 
uh, to identify really um, precisely the species, you, your vector control uh, that you will implement will have no value because you will not know if this, the mosquito you have is the major vector or not vector, or if the, this vector is biting uh, early at night or later because you have a, a cocktail of species. So it's very important to do a PCR uh, to uh, identify precisely what uh, species you have when you are collecting in the field. And that's the, the I mean, um, morphologically, you, you need to uh, identify the, the taxa you have, but it will, the, the morphology will not give you the species. Yeah. It will stop at the genus. So if you want to know the, 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 the species, you have to do a PCR. And what I would like to add, uh, and it, it, it follows what uh, uh, Marianne said, is that there are some complex of species in Asia that don't, still don't have PCR to identify the species. So this is a problem, and it's where we have gaps, because um, if Dirus minimus um, uh, Sundaicus have PCR techniques to identify the species. Uh, you have Lucos virus, for example, doesn't have a PCR technique. So we don't know when we collect Lucos virus, we don't really know uh, what species we have. So the, we need uh, more entomologists. And, and what you, you said, uh, it, it was uh, a joke uh, that uh, uh, entomologists maybe don't work so well. I would say that no, <laughs> of course, I am an entomologist, so I'm not going to say that. But we are missing entomologists, good entomologists, trained entomologists. And that's the problem. Uh, if when, you, when I go back, um, when I, uh, I looked at the map of uh, 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 HIV um, previously, I mean, how can you have this uh, empty uh, continent of India without no data on HIV. I mean, it's not possible. So uh, you, we are missing uh, people in the field. Yeah. We are missing entomologists, trained entomologists, and that's the uh, really uh, a challenge that we have to face uh, now. And uh, and so this is a, a major problem today. Great appeal there. Great appeal there from Sylvie. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, on entomology's uh, need for training, but also uh, uh, thanks also for the additional explanations you provided on the on the on the uh, the importance of tracking the complexes, but also the lack of PCR kits to, to do this analysis. Just ex exp expressing how difficult this is. We will discuss this much more going forward. I just want to. Uh, um, um, uh, throw this back to Sheila real quick so that we we can we can follow this on uh, going forward. Um, Sheila, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Uh, so, Professor Tirap, um, Fred, could you move to the other slide, please? Um, the, back to the the first one. No, the one on um, the next one. The next one. This one. No, no, the next one. Sorry. Um, this one. Um, well, it's okay. So it's it's the one on Dairus. <laughs> yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Professor Tirapa, uh, we were looking at this paper. Professor Tirapa, you have to teach Shayla how to pronounce the name. Tirapa. Is, is, is it Tirapa, Fredros? You're stressing me. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Yes, so uh, we were looking at this paper and we noted that um, the main vector now in Thailand is actually Anopheles dirus. Um, and we wanted you to comment a little bit about how this has changed because this paper was written or published in 2012. And so we would like your, you to speak a little bit about how this has changed. Um, if we still have Anopheles dirus as the, dirus as the main vector, um, and if so, because it, because of the vector behavior that is published in this paper, 
uh, being zoophagic and exophagic, which vector control interventions are suitable for such behavior. Thanks, Yana. <clears throat> so this, this paper published in uh, 2012, that is about more than 10 years ago. And this paper talk about, uh, I think, comparing dialysis and by my, uh, this within the Anopheles dialysis uh, sensorado. Uh, the, <clears throat> the problem of this paper, we do not, 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 not the problem, but we would like to, to compare two species called dialysis is a vector, by my is a vector. And these two vector mostly related to the, the deep uh, jungle in the forest, in the forest. But when, when we're talking about uh, this year, so this recent year, two years ago, the main vector of uh, Thailand that we found a lot is anopheles minimus, anopheles minimus. But how, I think, however, anopheles dialysis and minimus, they, some, sometimes they, they live in the same, uh, I mean, in the same area. Uh, in the same area of, of the forest, but minimus is more closely related to the human near the village. Uh, di uh, di uh, di dialysis is more uh, far more in the forest. So uh, we talking about Thailand. So now uh, the problem that we have found uh, about enough with minimus, except if people go deep to the deep forest, they, they might get bitten by enough with dialysis. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, yes. Mm. And the follow-up question was about um, the vector control interventions that target okay. dialysis. Okay, so so uh, you see now the, we have talking a lot about the uh, outdoor biting. And what we, because we have, we, we and the team work a lot on mosquito behavior, anopheline uh, mosquito behavior. And I, I don't say 100%, but, but more than, I think 80% of anopheline mosquito vector of malaria in Thailand, they buy outdoor. So in the past, uh, many of them died us, uh, of feed indoor, but uh, recently uh, we have found that uh, dialysis minimus, they prefer feeding outdoor. So talking about the outdoor, so this is, I think another issue that we discussed a lot about the outdoor transmission. So I think we have to find uh, some uh, tool or another tool that, that can be used to protect human if they go out to um, for work or go to the forest or go to the uh, whatever they want. So I think the tool is quite, uh, we don't have now, but but may, but may, maybe if you can carry one thing like uh, the repellent with you, the repellent, uh, topical repellent, or or uh, something like this. So this can be helpful. Special repellent. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, one thing that you have to be careful. I think you may have to uh, protect yourself from uh, bitten by mosquito. So whatever you can do. So this is the way that we can do protect yourself from biting. Yeah, thank you very much. Back to you, Fredris. Yeah, I would like us to stick to uh, to uh, Professor Therapop a little bit here. I mean, uh, Professor, we we are in uh, possession of this recent publication of yours. Uh, a fantastic analysis of the situation uh, um, in uh, in Thailand uh, with you and your colleagues. Uh, Eighty different species. Of course, you zero in on the on the main ones there, but you also list. Uh, some outstanding questions. Uh, uh, what you guys think, uh, and your colleagues, it's difficult to pronounce the first name, but Tan Chai, uh, Tan Chai, <coughs> member of your lab. Talk to us a little bit about why you think these are important questions. And, and it, reading your paper, it appears that this is not important, not just for Thailand, but actually for the greater uh, the Asian community. So it would be nice also to, to listen to uh, Professor Indra a little bit about this, but st we start with you, Terabo. Yeah, in this, uh, <clears throat> in this, in this publication, this is the, the review paper that we have uh, compiled uh, information, you know, twenty years back. So, <clears throat> what I would like to, what we would like to, to focus in this paper, I would like to share the information uh, on 
uh, mosquitoes and characteristic of mosquito behavior and vector control that we have done uh, especially in uh, Thailand. But uh, <clears throat> the the one that I uh, I think it very important that we talk about is outdoor vector control needed for malaria elimination. So uh, when we talking about outdoor uh, vector control, first thing I think we better know the characteristic of, of vector, if they bite outdoor or bite indoor. And another thing that Professor Siwi mentioned about the species uh, identification, I think is this is this very important. Our paper that uh, we, we published uh, recent years, uh, we, we collect the information. I think it's very good information, very precise uh, identification. But for the control, this another issue. If we have the basic information about the species, about the characteristic of each uh, correct uh, species identification, I think then the outdoor control will be more precise. This is what I would like to explain. So maybe uh, because the Dr. Tanan Chai uh, uh, was professor, so he's student as well. So uh, he went to Mount Korea working with Professor Sui. Excellent, excellent. This is this is this is nice. Just one point that we would like to raise here is um, usually we, we we inform our fellow entomologists that in some of these settings we must not forget the case management side. I mean we might not be uh, have a very effective vector control tool, but if the case numbers are um, individually identifiable. Um, and if you have a good surveillance system, then maybe there's greater room for just case identification and effective treatment. And, and, and so any, any comments around that, that would be uh, highly appreciated. And then it would be nice also to hear from Indra uh, on the same questions. Yeah, uh, thanks, Fred. I mean, I agree with um, Tirapath. We actually, uh, our main problem now is the leucosvirus virus group of mosquitoes, because this is the main vector for the simian malaria parasite. We never used to see many of these mosquitoes when we had human malaria, but now the whole scenario has changed. And so I agree that, yes, we really need to do PCR. Now we are doing PCR on each and every leucospirus group of mosquitoes to make sure that we get our identification correct. So that means we do PCR and send for sequencing. But we are now also working on a multiplex for the leucospirus group. So hopefully we will get that published um, before, hopefully before the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Because I think it's very important. There is the PCR multiplex for diarrhea. So it is important that we get one out for leucospirus. So at least people who are working can use this one because sequencing is too expensive. Nobody, people won't want to go into it. But if a multiplex is there, they can do it. And uh, the other part, of course, as we see now, the leucospirus group also, the mosquitoes are biting early and they are biting outdoors. And uh, when it comes to biting between human and monkeys, I think uh, some of the vectors like crescents is almost one is to one. It'll bite monkey or it'll bite human. But uh, when it comes to balabasensis, uh, balabasensis is in the Borneo. And there they seem to be like more attracted to... Um, no, we don't have results for Balaba sensors. Sorry, we did for latent. For latent, it showed us that it was slightly more uh, attracted to the monkeys compared to the humans. But latent was the predominant vector for human malaria in Sarawak, Malaysian Borneo. So fortunately now, I think uh, Malaysia has said that they do not have uh, human malaria uh, for the last two years. I'm not sure whether they have been certified malaria free, but um, as you know, Plasmodium nolesi is the predominant species. And also we have two other species that are coming up, Phanomogai and Inuai. So we will never sort of get rid of malaria as a whole. <laughs> and, and we will be speaking a lot about uh, uh, simian malarias, including, of course, uh, Plasmodium nolesi in this masterclass today. So hold, hold those thoughts. Uh, Shall I, if you allow me, I want us to go one slide back and talk to uh, Professor Lizette a little bit about here, and then Yasmin as well. So Lizette, you've, you've listened to the complexities and the challenges raised by our colleagues from Asia and also by Sylvie. Uh, do you think that the same problems 
exist in Africa? Or do we have a good handle of the vector species in Africa already? And, and I, the map uh, here is from, uh, from uh, Marianne's publication earlier, and I noticed that at this time we still didn't have an office called Utsai, so it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's lumped into an office Gambi uh, group there. Anyway, uh, 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 Professor Lizette, are we missing anything on our understanding of the vector diversity in the African continent, or is this an easier one than it is in Southeast Asia? Back to you. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, and, and who knows? I, I think the more we study these vectors, the more we look at their genetics, uh, the more complex these things become. We tend to focus on species that we can collect, those that we can identify, um, so I think there's a lot of things that's actually slipping through the cracks that we don't know. And, and the more we improve our resolution of distinguishing between species, the more we will know. Um, we know that Finestas, for instance, in, if you go back to Gillies and Kutsia and Gillies and the Mayland, there's a whole list of species that's described. Yes, with, even with our molecular methods now, very few of those species have actually been sequenced. Um, so where are those species? Have they been sequenced and be renamed without us knowing it? Um, I have no idea. Um, and, and I think how these vector species interact with each other. Um, you can have, and you have rainy seasons and dry seasons, and, and these vectors complement each other during these seasons so that it, it contributes to your continuous um, transmission that, that you see. And, and you have Arabiensis, for instance, that's also indoor, outdoor biting um, and, and quite flexible in its, its behavior as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of similarities, but I think there are challenges between the continents that are unique, as you will have unique challenges within countries on the same continent. And I think that's, that's why it's important to have entomologists in the field, not those in the lab, they do great work. But you also, yeah. you need to eat on the ground where people can use their eyes and, and see what the species are doing and, and what the biology are. Um, and that's a big gap, um, especially I think in Africa, came across now from, from Asia side, and I'm sure it's the same for, for the other countries as well. Um, so yeah, I think there's quite a lot of overlap, but um, also some differences, yeah. So do you think we are missing some species yet to be discovered? I think we've done a good job, but again, it's where the entomologists are. And if you map those locations and those species, you will clearly see where the gaps are on the continents, whether it's Africa or Asia, you will see quite a lot of concentration of, of collecting sites and, and species that's been yeah. sort of hoarded in, in pockets of Africa. And then there's big gaps, not because, um, they're not there, it's because there's no entomologist due to whatever, whether it's yeah. war zones or political zones or whatever. Um, so, so it's quite possible that we're missing a large uh, proportion of other species and how these, even if it's a known species, where it might have a different behavior. Right. Be right. classified as a different species? Don't know. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I, I mean, the, the Gambi 1000 group based out of uh, um, Sanga Institute uh, is putting out a lot of uh, data, uh, sequencing data uh, in public domain, actually. And uh, if you talk to them on the side, they will tell you that they are seeing a lot of uh, signs of species that are previously not described uh, in some of these places. So I, I guess, as you say, another appeal for entomologists to come back into to the game and, uh, and do this. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Lizette. Uh, Shela, do you have any specific questions to Lizette on this? No, Fredros, you can go ahead. Okay, then that, that allows us to talk to uh, uh, Professor Yasmin uh, a little bit and ask exactly the same question. I mean, Yasmin, uh, from the uh, Americas uh, side, do we see the same challenge? of complex uh, complexes. Are we still with Yasmin? Or did we lose them? Uh, sorry, sorry, I have to unmute. <laughs> uh, no problem, uh, yes. 
Oh, certainly. I mean, every every day the the problem is growing in 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 the Amer in the, especially in South America, where there are several species complexes. Are in, for instance, in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean island, the situation is fairly more confined to a few well-identified vectors. But every day, the list of new species in, in South America is increases. I mean, species that haven't even been described, they just are, they call it mitochondrial lineages because uh, they are not formally being described. And there is a whole range of, uh, Sylvie mentioned, you have species that might be involved in transmission and a whole range of uh, different um, roles in, in malaria transmission, which are weak vectors or something which are very, very efficient vectors. So the situation is really complicated and it is more complicated in, in in general, in the whole continent, at, at least from Mexico to, to South America, because of the behavior of the mosquitoes, the resources put into our research for identifying a species, and the, the availability of data, reliable data for, for control. Yeah. I mean, most of the species apart from Anopheles nunez tobari in some parts and Anopheles tarlingi in some areas, because tarlingi had a very, very uh, wide biting pattern. Sometimes it bite indoors late in the evening, so you can easily control it with, uh, with uh, treated nets. While in other areas, it bites early outdoors. So the problem is that now there is a, um, a general guidelines that I have seen in Pajo, Chai, Doctors Without Borders, they are more enfocated or focused in a vector control using indoor residual spraying and treated nets in areas where you have a mosquito that bites early outdoors. So I really don't know what's the, what's the science behind that uh, decisions but that certainly they are quite ineffective. And um, in those areas, certainly you have to be, you have to rely more on the, on the health system and that you have a strong surveillance system when you have rapid diagnosis and treatment. So the situation is really, really complicated. And I don't see the, the efforts and the resources put into trying to sort it out the, that complicated situation. I mean, what they are doing now is, okay, let's give them nets and uh, indoor residual spraying in some parts, but uh, I really do not understand why. No, thank you. Thank I don't you know, so I don't know if that answered your, your question, but... Uh, Definitely, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we're going to discuss a lot more, the, a, lot, a, a lot of this in much more detail when we come to the discussions around Venezuela. Uh, in Vene of, of the questions in Venezuela. But before I proceed, I also just wanted to say two things. First, thank you so much to everybody on the chat who is posting documentation and answering questions. Uh, Shell and myself are monitoring some of these questions and we'll raise them to the experts. But I also want to say thank you to our experts here because it's a very interesting that we have capacity to discuss malaria transmission in a broader context across all continents uh, with experts who have jointly worked on this subject, not separately, but, but jointly in most cases. These maps, for example, have, have been done by uh, 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 many of our experts who have collaborated in the, in the creation of this. So congratulations on that. And just, we just wanna say thank you again uh, 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 back to that. Shayla, please. Yeah, thank you, Fredros. Um, The next did, we lose, did we lose? Okay, it's the next question. Uh, Professor Lizetti, um, so this is a map of Africa that sort of illustrates the Rift Valley, the Great Rift Valley. 
so how do you think this has influenced um, the gene flow and the variability in the species that we have in sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah, so I think it must have a big difference. Um, I think in earlier years, it was probably a, a geographical diff, um, barrier between people traveling. Um, and of course, you've got heights of, of, of the rift itself that sort of prevent mosquito populations migrating to and fro. Um, over the years, of course, I think traveling between these difference and over the, the rift has become far easier. Um, but I do think the rift might have contributed to, to isolating some of the populations that we see uh, between even East Africa on the west side and east side of, of the rift. Um, and, and some of these were done with gene flow studies by, by a lot of experts on, on, on genetics. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting. It's stuff we need to know about, um, again, for if new novel control methods kick in, we're thinking of gene drive um, potentials that are, that are being developed. And, and of course, for that, you need to have a sort of system where you know that your gene will flow between your populations from east to west or north to south or whatever the case might be. Um, and understanding how these geographical barriers that we have prevent mosquitoes from traveling or people from traveling because people also help in dispersing mosquitoes to and fro. Um, and that's why it's important, I think, to know what's going on, even on the ground, on a geographical level, not only on the genetics of the mosquito, but both of them need to come together. Yeah, Other than the so, Rift Valley, any... oh, go ahead, go ahead, Sheila. Uh, just a follow-up question, whether there are any differences between the species on the two divides, on the two so we've sides. Done, we've done a little bit of work, again, on, on finestas, and and the study were very small and it did show some differences. And then there were other people who did really in-depth analysis on, yeah, on the microsatellite side. And, and they exactly showed that there was a gene flow barrier between the populations from either side of, of the Rift Valley. And that's quite interesting to know, yeah. I yeah, we just uh, posted a picture of that, of uh, part of your work, Lizette, where you look at this gene flow. Is that the one you're referring to? Yes, yeah, and it's a relative small study. Um, and, and we picked up quite a lot of variation. If you look on the picture that's on my right-hand side, we, although these specimens came from, they were collected from the same country, um, there definitely were differences that we, that we detected. And, and how much that will influence um, a gene drive mechanism, say from in Tanzania, with, if you release mosquitoes on the on the east will it automatically spread to the west we don't know um, but it will give some sort of insight what the mosquitoes are doing yeah, thank you Fred Ross. yeah uh, uh, Sheila if you don't, don't mind let, let's go back to this this slide here and I would like to just request our experts to check in other than the rift valley you know, the great rift valley we should say are there any other barriers that are that significantly uh, impact the distribution of these vectors. I, I think from here, what's obvious, of course, is the, the, the Rift Valley and then the, the desert areas in the north and the south. But are there any other geographical barriers that, that we need to be watching and uh, looking at? Uh, we, can, we can begin with you, Lizette, and then anybody else. So I would think uh, big lakes, because we know there's quite big lakes, like Malawi on a map looks relatively small. But if you're there on the ground, it's actually a big lake in Lake Victoria. It's huge water bodies and how much that influence, um, again, your gene flow between your mosquito species. Um, there's some good evidence that it does play a role. And the more I think human um, traveling between these regions uh, become more sort of often, um, it can sort of eliminate some of this, but yet those barriers are there. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Any, any other additions from any of our experts? If I can add something, yes. uh, you are talking about barriers that would stop the, the species from uh, moving around. But um, there is the, the ex an example that uh, showed the opposite is that uh, now uh, you, we have Anopheles stephensi 
or Stephen C, uh, that uh, is native from uh, India, that um, uh, occurs in uh, um, Arabic, uh, um, uh, how can I say that, the Ar Arabic Peninsula. But okay. now, now you find this species uh, in East Africa. So this species has moved uh, and is doing quite well in uh, um, Ethiopia, uh, Djibouti. Um, so you see the, the ba some barriers are very efficient against uh, some species, but uh, you have others that uh, can um, diffuse and extend to, uh, uh, and this is quite rare for Anopheles species. We, uh, we know the, the, uh, an example of Anopheles gambia that was um, colonizing um, Brazil in 1930 and then was eradicated. And uh, we found also an Anopheles gambia in Egypt, uh, which was, by the way, not gambia, it was Anopheles arabiensis. But having another species like Anopheles stephensi uh, in, uh, in Africa uh, is really a big, big threat because uh, this uh, mosquito, this species is found in uh, urban area. And as you know, the Anopheles mosquitoes are found uh, in rural areas. Uh, so having a mosquito in, um, in an, a different continent in uh, cities uh, and uh, publications that have been uh, uh, published recently show that uh, uh, with the, uh, the occurrence of this species in, the, in this part of Africa was um, linked to uh, an increase of malaria cases in uh, Ethiopia and Djibouti. So this species has to be, to be looked very carefully in the future because it may uh, move uh, to other cities in Africa and extend. So that, that's a big, big threat. Thank you. You, you, you give a, a good example of how a species can escape these terrestrial barriers. Uh, Sylvie, I remember a conversation we had with you where you said that on the Aedes side, it's much easier because of, or, 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 it's much easier for, for them to move across countries than Anopheles. Could, could you just explain a little bit, even though this is mostly about malaria vectors, but what makes the Aedes uh, or Culicines much easier to transmit oh. across borders? Yes, uh, Aedes and Anopheles uh, don't have the same biology. Um, Anopheles mosquitoes, uh, that's why they are uh, quite invasive um, mosquitoes, is because the uh, the um, eggs um, can stay uh, they, uh, desiccated, and uh, when there is a, a rain, uh, the larvae will uh, uh, will emerge from the from the eggs. You and mean Aedes? Right. I, I'm talking about Aedes. Aedes okay. mosquitoes, they have this characteristic of uh, accepting desiccation of their eggs. And uh, with the, the, the next rain, the, the eggs, uh, after being um, uh, sleeping for, for months, years, uh, they will, uh, um, the, the, the larva will hatch and the cycle will, uh, will start again with Aedes mosquitoes. That's why Aedes can uh, travel so well from one continent to the next on uh, used tires, on uh, lucky bamboo, um, you know, this lucky bamboo that travel with a little bit of water and, uh, and they, they move around in a different continent. I mean, the Aedes um, uh, Egypt, Egypti or uh, Albopictus, that Albopictus, that's the way uh, this mosquito travel to and, and uh, conquer all the continent. Anopheles mosquitoes, it's not the case. They travel as um, adult uh, stage uh, because the larvae, except Anopheles stephensi, but uh, usually the larvae of Anopheles mosquitoes require uh, natural, uh, um, a breeding site. So it could be uh, all kind of uh, breeding site, you know, the uh, stream or 
um, wetland or whatever. Uh, but you, it's rare to find anopheles mosquitoes in um, uh, man-made containers. Yeah. There's, there are few anopheles mosquitoes that uh, breed in man-made uh, containers, but it's really rare. That's why these mosquitoes, uh, uh, Anopheles mosquitoes, don't travel so, so well and they are not invading continents as Aedes uh, mosquitoes do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, some uh, great basic biology there of mosquitoes. Uh, thank you so, so much, uh, 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 Sylvie. Uh, Sheila, what's, what's your suggestion? Shall we move to residual transmission now? Or, uh, yes, yes, uh, but I have a question. Uh, I think Professor Sylvie mentioned something really interesting about Aedes mosquitoes, that they stay dormant or they aestivate uh, during the cold season. Does this happen with anopheles mosquitoes? This would be really interesting, especially for the Southern African countries. Do you want me to answer? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Um, uh, we know that, but Lisette um, may know uh, a lot more than I do, but uh, we know that, uh, for example, Anopheles gambier, uh, they, they can um, diapose or, or rest uh, as adult until uh, the, the, the rain, rainy season starts again and uh, the, the female will uh, uh, lay eggs. So the, the, the adult can, uh, can stay for several months before the, uh, the, uh, the density increase of the, the Anopheles uh, mosquito. Um, so that, uh, I mean, is it uh, a good answer for you or do you, do you need more? Maybe, maybe Lisette can- uh, Maybe Lisette, yeah. Can yeah. Say more. <laughs> yeah, we've got a study from, from South Africa. We, um, this was investigated, um, by one of our PhD students and uh, Professor Basil Brook was the co-authors there. Um, because South Africa, of course, we have summer and winter and the temperatures vary quite a lot. Um, and they looked into um, the possibility of the Anopheles from our Eastern coastal region to see if they actually um, estivate. And there was no evidence that they do that. Um, so it doesn't look like that's happening, but again, it's a very small study, it's localized. Um, and whether it's the same for in other African countries where you have maybe a dry season or other temperature fluctuations, it might be different, but um, we didn't find any evidence for, for estivation um, yeah. in the study we did, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Professor Lizette. Fred. Lizette, what do you make of these uh, uh, studies from West Africa about long distance travel for one of us? Yeah, it was, it's, it's quite interesting. And, and I know, um, I think it was in the 1950s, there were also some, some studies to determine the height that, that mosquitoes fly. Um, again, I think there's very few studies and, and the more we do, the more we will understand. Yeah. Um, I think it does play a role. We've seen it in other insects. Um, I can't think why it won't be the same, but how big that how big a role that plays in, in transposing mosquitoes or anophelines from one site to another will have to be investigate, um, investigated. Um, yeah, Thank it's you. interesting. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, do we move to residual transmission there, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Excellent. Please. Thank you. Uh, a, a quick, a quick uh, thank you note there uh, uh, to Marianne, who has just left. Uh, Marianne, thank you so much. Uh, to the rest of our experts, we would like to spend some time to discuss the subject of the so-called residual malaria transmission. Uh, and, uh, uh, Sylvie, forgive us here, but we would like to actually re recommend this specific article as primary reading for anybody interested in this subject, uh, uh, just given how comprehensive it is. This, this is a new one um, uh, from this year in, in the residual malaria transmission uh, supplement. This is a, pro a, a, a program actually where you also worked with Yasmin, so uh, um, with TBR support. So it's a lot of connectivity between, between the work you guys do here. In this, uh, manuscript, uh, uh, Professor Pia Carnival and yourself provide a list of um, possible reasons that we have residual malaria transmission. 
You talk about exophilic uh, behaviors. You talk about indoor outdoor bitings, and, and with very specific examples. You talk about the, the, the change there, uh, and then you conclude by by talk, by request by uh, suggesting integrated vector control um, uh, to address address uh, these questions. So. I, it, I would like us to, to begin from here and, and listen first to you, Sylvie, and then to Yasmin, um, to discuss whether these specific attributes are cut across the entire um, um, continent, if we already master them, or if the examples that you list here are the only ones, is it something, so for example, the exophilic behavior of the Anopheles dyros, is it possible that other mosquitoes will have it too, but we are not able to pick that up given the, the, the methods that we, that we are using at the moment. So a very general review of residual transmission in different confidence from you, Sylvie, and then it would be nice to hear from Yasmin also how this expresses in South, South America. Back to you. Yes, in fact, the, the more we study these mosquitoes, the, the more we learn. And uh, actually the, the fact that uh, uh, we have been using uh, a long lasting net for uh, uh, quite a long time now, we are uh, showing, I mean, uh, Professor Tirapap said that earlier, but um, we are finding that uh, the, um, many uh, species now are changing uh, behavior because as Lisa, Lisette said at the beginning, um, a mosquito uh, female, she, she wants to have a blood meal, period. So if she cannot get inside the house uh, because uh, uh, there is uh, insecticide, uh, the, the female will uh, change uh, uh, behavior and find a way to get this blood meal. So either uh, in biting earlier than before without using a long lasting net, uh, biting earlier at night or early in the morning when people are uh, uh, leaving the house. Um, I mean, they, they, they find a way to, to get this blood meal. So the, that's why this, we are, I mean, somehow discovering, it's not really discovering this residual malaria transmission because it was occurring before. But now we, there is a growing um, uh, amount of studies on, on this uh, uh, residual malaria transmission because countries are willing to uh, get uh, to be malaria free. And they, they, there is this, um, big problem of residual malaria transmission that uh, is difficult to tackle because there is no um, uh, there is no specific vector control as uh, long lasting net or insecticide residual spraying for uh, in, in, uh, indoor biting mosquitoes. There is nothing really um, available today to uh, stop this uh, outdoor uh, biting mosquitoes and this outdoor transmission. So, uh, and uh, as you said, Fred, uh, we th there are some studies here and there on the different continents, but I'm sure that uh, this uh, uh, residual malaria transmission is um, everywhere and uh, and the more we will study the behavior of the mosquito species, I'm talking about species here, not genus or whatever, cocktail of mosquitoes, um, we will see that um, uh, these, the, the mosquitoes are um, changing their behavior. Uh, if if the, the coverage of uh, long lasting net being used in some countries is very high mosquitoes will uh, will bite outside or there is another possibility also is that the the mosquitoes that were biting inside like minimus in asia um will um, the densities will go down and other secondary vectors will take over yeah. like arisona uh, in vietnam for example so you have all kind of um possibilities uh, in, in nature. And, and it's very 
interesting for, for us entomologists to, uh, to study these different aspects because the, uh, it's biology. So it's moving, it's changing all the time. And, right. and so it's important to, yeah, to have a better view uh, of what is, is going on in the field. If, if you allow me, I just want to interrupt there because I remember uh, Professor Tarapop was talking and uh, Professor Tarapop, please jump in here uh, if possible. It, it, when you were talking to us earlier, you mentioned, you alluded to the fact that some of the uh, um, uh, characteristics of the species in Thailand that were recorded before are now different when you when you look at it. Yes. Can you explain a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Let me add uh, uh, something that uh, for Professor we have mentioned. <clears throat> for example, in one place in uh, in the uh, mosquito collection sites along right. the Cambodia Thai oh, sorry Thai Myanmar border, in the past uh, I think twenty years back we have found uh, enough with minimus complex, complex, uh, within the complex, there are two species, uh, Anopheles minimus and, and Anopheles harrisoni. That, that uh, back to uh, 20 years back, we have about 50, 50% of Anopheles minimus and harrisoni. And just uh, uh, 10 years ago, we have almost 99% uh, belong to Anopheles minimus and less an Africa Harrisoni in the same place. And just recently, we went back to the few sites. Uh, we have uh, an Africa Minimus around uh, 80% and 20% belong to an Africa Harrisoni. Yeah. So, so you see now the thing is changing and, and Professor Siwi mentioned, I think biology is very interesting and it changes uh, depend on the timing. So uh, because of the so many things, I think, uh, in, uh, in environmental changes or human behavior changing. So the situation can be different compared to the past. So this is a good example for an Alfred Harris and I. Yeah. No, thank, thank you so, so much. Uh, uh, Yasmin, you raised some concerns about uh, uh, the, the current approaches for vector control uh, in South America. And, and when you when you were talking, you are raising points such as the ones that are um, uh, described here. How does the situation of residual malaria transmission or the so-called residual malaria transmission express in, in, in Venezuela and, and South America in general? Well, uh, in Venezuela, I won't, I won't call it residual. I will call it just, uh, it's there, it's all over. And it's, every day it gets worse and worse. So um, I, I cannot refer to residual malaria in Venezuela as well as in other parts of, uh, of, the, of South America. Um, the situation there is uh, really complicated. And then you have to be focused on the mosquitoes behavior. That uh, as Sylvie said that the use of insecticide have the change the behavior of mosquitoes. Yes, that had been demonstrated for some species. But for instance, um, recalling the situation in Venezuela by the half of last century, when the uh, malaria eradication program was highly effective and efficient, they could not eradicate malaria from areas where mosquitoes were actually not resting inside houses or mosquitoes were a strongly exophagic and exophilic. And I can give you an example that is still, the, the, the malaria control program is trying to, to address, which is Anopheles aquasalis. Anopheles aquasalis is a coastal malaria vector. In the 1950s, it never was eradicated from, from the coastal area where they still have persistent transmission of malaria, although the vector control program was highly effective. And the only way they could get rid of malaria in Sucre State and in those areas was based on mass stroke administration. And they keep it under control for several years. When they relaxed the surveillance in those areas, malaria came back. Now, that's one of the major fossils in Venezuela. And what they are trying to do is, you know, 
using the same recipe. They're using indoor residual spraying and bed nets. And certainly it's a mosquito that bites early yeah. between six and seven in the evening outdoors. So if you don't go to the root and intend an uh, integrated approach yeah. Yeah. where your health system has to be strong, you will never going to get rid of malaria in that area. And it's not a matter of poverty or anything. I mean, it's a people, everybody is in the beach, it's coastal area, people, I mean, men are usually with just shorts. They don't even have a shirt because it's hot and people are just sitting outside, drinking beer, playing domino, and they don't care for the mosquitoes. Yes. And they get malaria and they, they already know, oh, I have malaria, I have to go and get some chloroquine or whatever, if there is a treatment available. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. That's, that's one of the situations. The other situation is certainly with the, in the era of DDT and of Lingi, the main vectors throughout the country was eradicated. It disappeared from vast areas of the country and malaria disappeared. But then with a human intervention, environment modification, new species are colonizing and you can have now, as Sylvie said, a cocktail of species in highly uh, hot foresight of malaria transmission. You don't have one species that we have in the past. We have several. So, um, and in those areas, certainly malaria, most of the transmission occurs outdoors early in the evening. The main vectors, I, I will say over 70% of bites occurs before midnight, yeah. where everybody's outside. Thank you. Thank you. Even so, so the much. children, even the children, 10 in the evening, you can find big children playing around. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, Lizette, there's, there's a lot of chat, a comment on the chat about uh, misguided, like Yasmin is saying, uh, interventions focusing a lot on endophily, endophagy. There are suggestions there to talk a little bit about the aquatic stage and, and what we can do in that space. I want to put this to you, um, and talk to us a little bit, and, and, and then maybe after, after you, Lizette, we can, can hear from Indra on whether this approach would be applicable in Asia. Uh, Lizette, we start with you. Um, yes, I agree. And it takes me back to my, I, I think the more approaches you use, the more successful you're going to be. And again, what works in one country doesn't work in another country. Um, larval source management from, from our experience work um, up to a point, but it's costly. So it costs um, the countries quite a lot of money. It's labor intensive. Um, and if you work in an area that's not accessible, um, although there's villages in, in remote areas to actually implement and, and monitor those interventions becomes really a challenge. Um, so I think the key is to, to understand what species you have, where you work, yeah. how feasible each intervention is, because it's nice um, embarking on an intervention, but if it's not sustainable in a country, um, on the long term, sometimes there's more damage afterwards than before. Um, so I think it's very important to understand the biology of your species um, in South Africa and Southern African areas. I know it's not the same for the rest of Africa, but to actually find even Finestas Group larvae are a lot of work and highly unsuccessful. So you can do lots and lots of larval collections and you come home, you rear them through, or you do larval morphology and you have one. Um, and again, it comes back to logistics. Um, somebody's got to pay salaries within the control programs. Um, and, and then it becomes more difficult to decide what to do or not because funding are limited. Hey, 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 hey. And, Countries, I think, have to work very wisely with the resources they have, um, the personnel they have, um, and the environment that they work in. So I think there's no simple answer to say, yes, you need to do this and your problems will go away because um, it's, it's a quite a complex disease because it not only involves the mosquito. Um, I think it's quite easy to kill a mosquito. We've seen that in the lab. Um, very easy <laughs> to kill them in the lab. But if you go down into the field and on the ground, you put your boots on, 
and you try and you then start understanding all the complexities um, within a control program, yeah. then all these challenges play a role and they play a big, big, big role. And we have to be sensible for those as well. You know, so that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. In, in race, are uh, these issues of love yeah, source think, management um, applicable? I think the love source management, way back in 1921, uh, I think you all would have heard of Patrick Manson. He did um, a lava source management to get rid of malaria in the area. I think he built uh, uh, buns so that the seawater doesn't come in contact with fresh water to get rid of the breeding of the sundaicus. And then when he found that uh, maculatus was breeding in um, slow flowing streams, he did subsoil drainage. And I think Malaysia adapted a lot of those in the early days and after that, it was followed up, of course, with residual spraying and then with insecticide treated nets. So now we come to the problem of outdoor biting. So to me, I think uh, what malariologists will say is that we will treat everybody. So once we get a case, we make sure we treat so that there is no human malaria parasite around. So that is why they say that, oh, let there be anaphylis, but no malaria. Anaphylism without malaria. See, that is why they have they don't seem to take so much into problem about outdoor biting because they manage to uh, make sure that they do not have malaria, human malaria cases occurring over the past two years, though we have the mosquitoes biting outdoors. Anophilism without malaria. Without malaria. So I think they are looking at that point. But to me, as you say, maybe later on we will come about what about Simian malaria being transmitted to human. Yeah, who will, who will do that? Bite, that is biting outdoors, and I still cannot think of what mechanism or what control tools we can do, use to break that chain of transmission. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so, so, so much. I want to mention one quick point, and then I'll hand this back to Sheila. Uh, um, um, Sylvie, one thing we noticed in this paper is uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, it doesn't say much about humans. It uh, kind of says a lot about vector behavior and all that, uh, but generally does not speak about uh, the human behavior here. I would like to assume that this was um, uh, uh, not intentional and that you still agree that the human behavior plays an important role as well. Is, is, is that is that a right, in, um, Sylvie? Yes, you're, you are totally right. And uh, the paper would have been too big if we, uh, <laughs> if we had this section on human behavior, but maybe I will, uh, I will talk to Pierre to have another paper. But uh, <laughs> um, besides joking, uh, it, it's totally true that um, in fact, uh, uh, there are papers, and actually the, the paper by uh, uh, Jeffrey He on, on uh, residual malaria transmission also is a, a good one that shows, uh, presents the, the human behavior and how this, uh, the behavior will uh, uh, increase uh, malaria transmission somehow. For, for example, in uh, many uh, villages now in, in Africa or Asia, um, probably also in, uh, in America, um, people are watching TV late at night. And so they, they go to, to sleep under a net later. But why, when they, they watch TV, uh, the mosquito will bite, uh, bite them. So that's uh, um, um, a big and uh, recurrent problem that is being uh, uh, published uh, recently. And uh, even, even children, there is a study showing that uh, children watching TV before uh, going to bed in, um, in, a, in, a, in a room without any net uh, got malaria um, uh, much, uh, at a much higher uh, number than before. So you see, watching TV is, uh, it can be, yeah. uh, um, uh, well, problematic, I would say. So the human behavior is, of course, uh, uh, major. It's uh, um, a mosquito, the mosquito behavior will adapt to um, the uh, people's behavior. So if the, the behavior of the people changes, mosquito will, will change as well. So of course, they, they, go, they go along. 
for I, I mean, of course, for anthropophilic mosquitoes, mosquitoes that uh, prefer to bite uh, humans. But uh, yeah, they, they really go along together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sheila, please. Fred Ross, I think we have exhausted um, the residual transmission topic. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we can move on to the next topic. Okay. Unless you Perhaps, have further questions. Just, just one uh, uh, that uh, if, if you think we've exhausted that, we can, we can leave it at that. But very quickly um, um, uh, to, to our experts here, there are scientists who claim, and, and we have an example there, that in many cases, even this indoor, in, in some cases, even these indoor interventions would be very effective. Uh, um, uh, again, as indoor biting mosquitoes. Uh, I wonder what you'd say about that. A either of you can, can, can address this. And we have an example there from my colleague Nico Kovella and, and, and Jerry and, and maybe myself a little bit. The argument here is that you know you are doing also some mass killing, and in that way, uh, you are protecting. You are just you know uh, um, uh, protecting a lot, even the people. And the second thing is that these mosquitoes, at least once in their life cycle, will make contact with the ITN. Well, I can maybe add um, yeah. from South Africa with IRS, we were able to eliminate finestas in the 1950s. And, and of course, we then changed, I, I think most people are familiar with the story, um, change of insecticide and in the, the control program then failed, not because it didn't work, just because the insecticide then became no longer effective against finestas and the species reinvade South Africa. And the reinvasion, by the time we, we of course saw this first by clinical cases and people presenting with, with malaria. And this happened long before we could actually detect the mosquitoes in the field. So it's, and this was specifically for finestas. And again, I can only speak from my own experiences and it will differ from differ between the countries. But yeah. for us, it showed how effective finestas is in, in, in Southern Africa, because by the time we could actually collect them and it was not due to a lack of trying, I can, I can tell you that. Um, and the same happened in um, Namibia in a project we, we were fortunate enough to, to be involved in that um, an increase in malaria cases. And again, we searched a lot and a lot of houses, long hours, tired entomologists, and we collected one or two, I think it was one specimen at the end. Um, also reinvading Namibia, most likely from the Angola side. But it shows you that you need all your resources and your health structure need to be in place from your right. detection of your of your and treatment of malaria to the entomology. But yeah, the entomology might not always tell you because the abundance of species at that time might be very low. And then the effort you put in is extensive. <laughs> That's all I can say here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much. Uh, Thanks, 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 Lizette, for emphasizing that point and to everyone else. Uh, Shil, I'm going to throw this back to you. Um, Thank you, Fred. I was trying, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was trying to get off mute. Um, so, Professor Sylvie, we were talking about, and the hottest topic right now is, of course. Um, China's um, elimination story. Um, and we wanted to understand a little bit more. Is this also a case of anophilism without malaria? What is happening? What was happening before the elimination in terms of vector densities, vector species, diversity and behavior? And now that China has eliminated, how has that changed? Well, um, the, the densities of the main malaria vectors in, in China decreased. Um, so, the, for example, it's very hard to find Anopheles diaries uh, uh, in, uh, in China now. Uh, the, the, the one, the, the, vectors, the, the vector species that remains 
is Anopheles sinensis that um, is widespread uh, in, in China. And um, uh, I mean, there are not many studies, but uh, uh, Anopheles minimus and Arizona uh, are still uh, uh, occurring, but at very low density. But um, I would say that um, the, the key point in China was the, uh, the rapidity of the, um, of the uh, intervention uh, in, uh, in the field. So when, uh, when there is a malaria case uh, found uh, any, anywhere in China, uh, there is the strategy of one, three, seven, so in one day, uh, the, the report of the malaria cases has to be uh, uh, given to the higher authorities. Uh, within three days, the person has to be, uh, um, has, needs to receive, of course, the medication and um, a vector control uh, needs to be done within the three days after finding the, the, the case. Um, and uh, and seven, seven days, um, it's to um, to do the, uh, the a study of a very thorough study about the type of vector, um, the the place uh, where the the person got malaria. I mean the, the so it, the efficiency of the Chinese authority is uh, impeccable, and when they find uh, when there is one case, I mean they. they um, there is an action behind uh, very quick. So th that's why uh, they um, eradicated uh, um, autochthonous malaria. However, uh, the problem they have now is imported malaria. And we published uh, a paper on imported malaria because uh, many Chinese work in Africa and uh, in India and they go back to China uh, with um, some of them a malaria parasite, uh, and uh, and so that that's something they, they need to monitor very um, uh, clearly and very uh, precisely in order to avoid any uh, autochthonous cases of malaria in China in the future. But um, but of course the Chinese know that, so they are very. Uh, very careful when people Chinese go back to their country, or, or not only Chinese, or also uh, uh, tourists. Or you know, they they have they, they are careful, yeah. but that's the threat uh, uh, for for China. Yeah, thank you, Sylvie. So uh, I think one one last one. So what lessons can entomologists take from from the story in China? especially for pre-elimination countries? Uh, well, entomologists, uh, they, they have um, um, to control, uh, control vectors. I mean, this uh, and, uh, and all, all possible ways uh, have to be implemented in the field. So when you have uh, uh, indoor biting mosquitoes, uh, you have to sleep under bed nets, of course. But uh, when you have outdoor biting mosquitoes, um, uh, there are several uh, possibilities, several approaches uh, to, to be uh, used, such as repellent, topical repellent, uh, uh, the use of uh, um, attractive toxic sugar baits or uh, eave tubes with insecticide. I mean, there, there are several uh, um, strategies that can be combined, but. Uh, as Lizette said before, um, integrated vector management is the key um, to uh, uh, lower this um, the the transmission by mosquitoes. Yeah, thank you. Sir. And, and it, it's what it's what they did in China. I mean, uh, the, they use uh, long-lasting nets. So they and and of course, the, as I said, uh, um, patients are. Uh, very uh, quickly uh, taken, uh, given medication. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, Fredros. Uh, thank you. 
I think we will skip this. I mean, we, we noted, uh, Sylvie, in one of your uh, uh, recent publications with colleagues in the monitoring of vectors between China and Myanmar, um, Anopheles sinensis and, and the other vector there have incredibly high survival rates, uh, but, but no, no disease. So uh, because of time, we will skip that. But if you have any quick comments about, about this, this, this specific subject, yeah, you can go ahead. Um, yeah, the, the, the threat for China is also the, we didn't speak too much about, about that, actually not at all today, but, uh, but the, the fact that um, uh, people are moving um, and uh, there is no border for, for most people that are uh, seeking, uh, you know, um, uh, professional activities uh, uh, road or uh, so th that's the problem with China that uh, Myanmar having uh, many cases of uh, uh, malaria uh, is um, is a threat for for China so uh, the 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 main strategy there is to have an international approach to um, eliminate malaria and um, so I know that uh, China and uh, different countries in Southeast Asia are um, willing to uh, to work together in order to eliminate uh, malaria along the international borders because in asia the problem of malaria is along the international uh, borders in, in right. thailand in southeast asia uh, everywhere so uh, if the, the countries are uh, having a, a common strategy to uh, eliminate uh, uh, malaria and uh, to um, control the, the, the movement of population, uh, malaria will uh, greatly decrease in, in Southeast Asia. So that, that's one of the key, uh, key points uh, for, to be implemented in the future. Uh, Professor Lizette, this is the same situation you have in Southern Africa, right? The international approach is. Again, I missed the last bit. Sorry, Fredras. Sylvie, Sylvie was saying that it takes multiple countries to address the problem. And, and I mean, you, you guys have a very good example on how Southern African countries are dealing with it. Yes, yeah, so, so I can agree with, with Sylvie. Part of it is um, none of these countries, uh, most parts of Africa, Asia, I'm sure it's exactly the same, are an island population. So yeah. what your neighbors do influence what happens in your country. So it's important to have these cross-border initiatives um, and to understand what happens in the mosquito populations on, on the border next to you, because if they have resistance, it's a matter of time and you will also detect them in your country. So I think having good political relationships and communication between entomologists um, for a start between these countries can, can go a long way um, in, in sort of predicting what might happen between the countries because they are all interlinked. And of course, mosquitoes fly wherever they want to. So a border um, is not necessarily a deterrent for mosquitoes and people cross borders. In South Africa, our imported malaria cases um, with people with gametocyte carriers from other countries remain a problem. And that's where your secondary or your outdoor vectors um, also then get exposed to these and, and continue to, to add to the transmission or the residual transmission that you see. So very important okay. to have as many players in your orchestra as you can, is my suggestion. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, um, um, three quick topics that we would like to go over. Uh, the first is Venezuela. We would like to talk a little bit about Venezuela. We would like to talk to Professor Lizette a little bit more about the uh, 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 malaria transmission in Africa and uh, molecular systematics. And then we would like to talk about Plasmodium nolesi. So uh, in, in the next uh, few minutes left, we will have some questions specific in this. And, and let us begin with Venezuela. Uh, Yasmin, what is happening in Venezuela? At one point, you had no malaria at all, and now, it's a hot spot. What is happening there? Well, the situation is, uh, what happened is uh, very complicated. And uh, I will say that the reason for that is a human-driven problem. And uh, 
is, I will say, is mainly a government-driven problem. Because if malaria was eradicated for much of the country, set of these small pockets where mosquitoes did not rest inside houses and did not were controlled with DDT, the part of the, the one that you have in red there, the southern part of the country, there, there was a small fall site, which in the 1960s, Dr. Gabaldon called uh, refractory malaria, because it was malaria in a meridian populations, people in remote areas where the vector was Darlingi, there were no, they said, spreadable uh, surfaces, and there were these small fall sites. But with the event and the, uh, of the increasing in gold mining and diamond mining in Bolivar State, I mean, which is this right large area bordering Guyana and Brazil, people started to go into the forest for gold mining. At that time, I mean, there was not much that they could be do for the vector control because it was Sarlingi. I mean, the densities were very low and Sylvie even went to Bolivar State with me and. E.L. Payton, if you remember, long time ago, um, mosquito densities were low and with very um, biting behaviors. Uh, so the, uh, what, what, the, what the malaria control program did at that time, and let's, let's say in the 80s and early 90s, they have a kind of um, control with just giving chloroquine to, to anybody passing throughout the, that road. But then there was chloroquine resistance, so they have to get other drugs and that. And then in the early this century, like I would say it was starting in 2007 and eight. then the government at that time, Chavez said, no, you have to go to a gold exploitation because that belongs to everybody even going into, into well-protected area national parks. So there was a vast people and with economic problems in the country, there were vast moving population towards that area. And also people coming traditionally from Brazil, Guyana and the Caribbean, Colombia. I mean, you could find there people from all kinds of nationalities. And at the same time that they were, you know, free will to go and exploit gold, then there was no more vector control program or malaria control program. There was no in inversion investment in, uh, in drugs and in vector control, not even buying a single net for a long, long time, for several years. And certainly the situation got out of control. And, uh, and nowadays, I mean, I will say for the past four or five years, I mean, to talk about malaria and the number of cases in Venezuela is, um, is illegal because that's top secret. I mean, the data is top secret. It's not available. In my case, particularly, I haven't been able to go to the field since 2015. No access. Because then you have to confront the guerrillas, uh, the, the government patrols, I mean, you are kind of subversive if you're trying to do any research in the area. So what the situation right now there is really dramatic is the, I mean, Venezuela, which has about, um, I will say 25 million people have more malaria cases than Brazil, which has 200 million people. So that'll give you an idea of the, the magnitude of the problem. And uh, in, in about, about two years ago, then they started to, to do something about malaria because there were other foreign interests in the country and certainly malaria was something that was driven those uh, foreign uh, interests, which uh, uh, you can now find people from, uh, from Hezbollah and Colombian guerrillas and Chinese, all that in Bolivar State. So then the government decided to uh, invest in getting people together and provide bed nets and uh, buying uh, 
treatment and uh, again, retrain the people in malaria diagnosis and, and the treatment. So, but uh, what they have done is really very little compared to the, the side of the problem. And in the past, there was only one vector. Now we have a, a whole range of vectors. And as I mentioned, uh, environment fragmentation have provided a different uh, ecological sites. Our niches have been exploited and colonized for different mosquito species. In the 1990s, when I would used to work in Bolivar State, we, the Anopheles starlingi densities were very low. Nowadays, you have several species, very high densities, and, uh, and uh, the, the parasite uh, infection rate in mosquitoes have tripped, uh, have been uh, in, how, how, have been increased by three times, yeah. I will say. Triple, yeah. 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 As you we were talking, I was just flipping through some of the data from Brazil, from, uh, from Venezuela. Here is some of your work uh, on the vector species. Uh, but but uh, we, we have additional questions on that and we would like you to express. But before we go to that, I just flipped through that because, because I wanted uh, the participants to see the the, the data sources, which it's interesting you say that the data actually might not be itself up to date because of poor access. But, uh, you know, the, the page that we were showing earlier, um, some of the authors there have also noted uh, that uh, uh, Venezuela is classified as a middle income country. And, and so traditionally they would not have access to global fund, for example, and yet they have as much malaria in terms of APIs as Ethiopia. Uh, uh, close by there, uh, meaning they will need some special considerations. I hope they have special considerations now from Global Fund um, uh, to get this. Now, having noted that, uh, Yasmin, you have recently written about uh, uh, Dr. Arnoldo. I don't know if that's the right, the right uh, pronunciation of the name. Yes, Arnoldo Arnold, yes, Gobaldon. Yes. Yes. yes, this is a legend in, in, in Venezuela. This guy is a legend somehow in terms of malaria control. And I, I, I don't know if his grandson is on the call today. He has a grandson who is still very active on malaria control as well. I was hoping he would be on the, on the call to us. Talk to us about what Arnoldo did in Venezuela that led to malaria elimination and why uh, uh, the country is not willing to, and, and what can be lessons we can learn from this going forward to address the Venezuelan situation, but also other situations. And then feel free to give a little history on this because not everybody is conversant with the, with the uh, Arnoldo Gabaldonos. So, yes, well, Arnoldo Gabaldon has, um, first of all, was a public health medical doctor with an excellent training. And in the, in the 1930s, when the, the dictatorship died, the, 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 the dictatorship at the time died, then he was asked to come and join the Ministry of Health. And malaria certainly was a major problem in, in Venezuela. I mean, it was the most deadly disease in the country. And uh, he had the government support and the resources to create, I will say, an army of public health people involved in the eradication of malaria. So he tackled the disease, first of all, training all the personnel to all labels, the medical doctors, the inspectors, the health inspector, even secretaries were trained properly to tackle the situation. He has the resources and he at attended the disease as a integrated problem. First of all, he have, uh, he have to give treatment, treat, so diagnosis and treatment was the first line, vector control, and then in the 1945, 46, when DDT was available, he started a very successful program with TDT, which worked as a Swiss watch. I mean, every six months you could visit any house in rural Venezuela and had been sprayed with TDT. 
and there was a record. You could go in every house, check the cards with the record, when had been spread and all that. And also he looked into the uh, comprehensive health characteristic of population. So providing good housing, latrines or sewage disposal, uh, availability of uh, pipe water. So it was really integrated. So what it started as a malaria control program, it was called malaria eradication program, became actually an um, integrated health system for the whole population, especially in, in rural areas. So in that time, improving housing condition, you control also Chagas disease in the part of the country where it was endemic, and also got parasites because we were providing pipe water and, uh, and switch disposal. So that's uh, his major. I mean, he had a wonderful view and he put it into practice. And of course he has the support, he has the funding for that. And also training was important. So even he created the School of Malariology when the, there were people from all over the world. I, I think it was from about 152 countries, people that went to be trained in the school in, in Maracay. Um, so that was his, um, his vision and how the problem has to be tackled from an integrated point of view. Right, right. No, thank you. Thank you so, so much. I hope that this is some of the lessons that, that we, could, uh, we, could, we could take for other places. Um, we noticed that the training programs that Arnoldo set up was still active until very recently. Uh, unfortunately, Venezuela is in the situation we are. We hope that the, the situation will, will, uh, will go down. Lastly, uh, Yasmin, talk to us a little bit about the vectors right now, uh, the, the vectors in, in Venezuela. Well, vectors, several, <laughs> several, and with different uh, biting, resting behaviors and uh, exploiting different larval habitats. When you talk about um, source management for vector controlling malaria, I mean, when you see the numbers and the size of larval habitats in Venezuela, you just said, forget it. In the 1930s and 40s, Gabaldon was very successful in major cities with a, a lot of investment in engineering, sanitation, getting rid of malaria in the most important cities in the northern part of the country. But nowadays, those kind of invasions are unfeasible. I mean, yeah, it's just, uh, just unthinkable because uh, larval habitats are huge, huge. If you, if you see a satellite image, I mean, yeah. you said it's no way that you are going to use any larval source management. Unless you are, you know, you are in a small community and you have a small lagoon, and that you know that the mosquitoes come from that lagoon to and and it's biting, you know, forty people in that community. That's the only thing that you can do there regarding uh, larval source management. Uh, vectors, as I mentioned earlier, apart from some uh, Anopheles uh, Nunez Tobari in. Western and Northeastern Colombia that bites late in the evening indoors where you can easily, I mean, with using treated nets will be effective to control uh, malaria in that area. And in some areas where Darlingi certainly bites indoors late in the evening, in general, vectors do bite early outdoors. And certainly not driven by the use of insecticide because I have said in the past 30 or 25 years or so, the use of insecticide in Venezuela has been minimal or non-existent. So you, you just put up a, a little bit, a, a slide there with, with two vectors species from there. Is that, is that useful? Uh, I think that's yes. from your work as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, as you see there, the Darlingi certainly goes inside houses, but it bites throughout the night. And in those gold mining areas, I mean, those mine areas, they work 24 hours, 24 by seven. So people are outdoors most of the night. 
So even though, though you are protected by a net during, during your sleep, you still get some part of the population being beaten because of their activities outdoors. And as you see, it said an Ophelis Marajuara, where at that time we thought it was an Ophelis Marajuara. Now we know it's an Ophelis albitarsis F. So it's from the albitarsis complex. And as you see there, most of the vital cores outdoors early. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the paper you guys just published, I think two or three months ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Okay, I think, I think we put it up there, so yeah. That's good. Yasmin, if you, if you allow us, uh, the, the, the story of Venezuela is rather, uh, 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 our other experts, I hope you, you bear with us this a little bit more focus on this, because this is a place where we expected malaria to have disappeared. And now it's it's 50% I mean, of malaria in Latin America is now in Venezuela, 53% to be exact, given the government numbers. Uh, we have colleagues on the call like uh, uh, Charlwood, uh, Derek, who have worked here before, and I'm just wondering whether Derek, you guys have any, 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 any comments on this, especially from a historical perspective. I see some some text here on how Arnoldo was so interested in malaria eradication and, and how this fight went on. D Derek, if you don't mind, just come in for like one minute or two or, or a few seconds and talk to us about this. Derek, are you there? He's, he's not with us. Okay. Um, brilliant. Okay. Well, I'm going to bring this back to Shayla. Um, Sh Shayla, I know you have uh, something else to talk about here, but I also want to put you on the spot as an expert. You've worked a little bit with your colleagues in Panama. So, uh, yes, Shalud, please. Yes, Charlwood is here. Hello, Fred. Hello, Fred. Fred Ross. How are you? Thank um, you so much, Derek. Just working out. At... So, what do you want me to? No, uh, we were asking yeah. whether you have any comments on the situation with Arnoldo and and, and, and Venezuela. Well, and... of course, I'm I'm now already myself an old an old uh, generation entomologist, but of course, yeah, Gabaldon, Gilioli, Gillies. Um, uh, they, these were all inspirational people uh, and even if you didn't know them their work was just outstanding uh, and obviously a, a huge example to young people like me so yeah and not the, for, for a number of reasons one was the thoroughness with which they did their work. The other was the, the realization of what their work did not show. So that um, they, pe pe these people were very, very conscious of, of, of actually what they, what they knew and what they didn't know as a result of their work. Um, and they did not necessarily generalize to, 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 to beyond what they actually had found out, if that helps. But they, they I, I just posted a comment, something about um, that, that one of the papers of Gabaldon, where he was looking at the, where the sporozoites end up in the mosquito, because, you know, some of them end up in the wings, let's say. Um, I think he dissected something like, I can't remember now, but it was like 170,000, you know, thousands and thousands of mosquitoes. And he, and he just dismissed the results in a little sentence. So they'd been done a huge amount of work. And um, he, he, he was concise in, in what the results meant. Whereas you know, somebody like, and I, I have to say, I did try to do, to emulate this in the, some of the work that I did in Papua New Guinea, where we collected thousands of mosquitoes through different moon phases. And then we were able I, to, to try and, and I was able to use that data 
in just another sentence. And that was basically a, a kind of um, uh, take on, on Gabaldon's paper. <laughs> uh, I don't think many people realize it, but that was what it was. That was why I did that. So, um, yeah, the, the inspirational and should not be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yasmin, do you think that uh, uh, Venezuela um, and, and we recognize the challenges you mentioned earlier, difficulties in fieldwork, financing, government uh, uh, situation there, the gorillas. Do you think that uh, the lessons that, that, that came out of Venezuela in the days when malaria control was effective there and, and some of the work that you continue to do now can be packaged uh, 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 in a way that we uh, uh, can benefit, uh, like Derek is saying. So this does not die. It's this pretty good history of malaria control in, in Venezuela. Um, it's difficult to say, Fred, nowadays, because um, you don't know exactly what's inside the head of the people that is ruling the country. So, it's difficult to say. People like myself and many other colleagues are trying to do our best just to keep trying to do something and to give a um, strong base, base data to provide to the malaria control program and the things that should be done. But um, apparently that we are talking to, to ourselves, not to the people that should be listened to. So it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult nowadays because it needs a tremendous investment and capacity building in, in, uh, in, in putting into the human resources mainly, and also to provide a strong and to, let's say, to have again a strong or a much stronger health care system will uh, will will be the the major things to be do and um, the other thing considering the the biting behavior of the mosquitoes even the investment should be larger because certainly for vector control of these um, early outdoor biters mosquitoes which are highly efficient for instance, at Lindy, I mean, over a very heavy rain, you can still collect a large number of mosquitoes biting. I mean, how they do that, I don't know, but they're highly efficient. And um, certainly the, the, the goal will be to invest in, the, in gene driving uh, um, tools for mosquito control. But in the meantime that you have that, you have to invest a lot, a lot in improving uh, health conditions and, uh, and, uh, and the health system. I mean, you have to have available drugs and diagnosis, and not only for that, even to having an aspirin. Sometimes it's even impossible to get an aspirin in Venezuela. So, uh, that's that. In it, it means that you have to have a change of uh, vision of the problem, and what is important for the population is mainly that you provide health and education. So yeah. that's that's my opinion, my particular personal opinion. Thank you so much. We appreciate the the, the service, and uh, hopefully. Um, you guys don't give up on this. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Sheila, please. Yeah, Fred, you wanted me to talk a little bit about Panama. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you choose if, if, if this is something that you want to address. I know you've worked in Panama a lot with your colleagues, um, but you can, you can carry this forward as... No, maybe just briefly. Um, so the yes. story in Panama is 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 not different. But let's focus on the on presently um, what is happening with the malaria control program in Panama now. They are sort of adopting the integrated approach, where initially they were conducting just IRS, um, and then 
after entomological surveillance, which was really geared to understand what the gaps were in protection. Um, and this was also, um, so in, in, apart from entomological surveillance, they also conducted several studies like we've seen, uh, we've seen earlier where human behavioral studies were also conducted to try and understand how humans interact with vector control interventions. So from the entomological studies and human behavioral studies, they actually realized that bed nets and hammock bed nets would actually be uh, provide more infection as well as level source management or labiciding. So in a nutshell, ENTO data was used to sort of inform which um, vector control interventions would be included in the inter integrated vector uh, control approach. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so moving on to back to our masterclass friends. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Professor Lizetti, before we move, move, move on to um, simian malaria, uh, we would just like to understand um, some aspects about sampling malaria vectors. We've heard earlier that there are biases when it comes to sampling malaria vectors. Uh, we don't really get the data that we need. Sometimes the data is, um, is incomplete. Would you kindly talk to us really briefly about the most important aspects when it comes to sampling malaria vectors? Yeah, so what I can say, I think it's again important to understand what you want to sample and what your question are, um, because that's going to guide you as to what methods you're going to use and if those methods will answer your question. If you want to determine, um, like we had previously, the human blood index and you use human landing catches, then of course it's the wrong method because they might have fed on you um, during your collection methods and they would be positive for, for human blood meals. Um, so I think it's also important to understand um, the if you want to go after a specific species, for example, to know what is the biology of that species and then to guide you as to where your efforts need to be. If I'm looking for outdoor biting and resting mosquitoes, but I sample indoors, then of course, um, that's an obvious um, error from your side if you, if you do that. Um, and it depends on the area where you work. So in South Africa, for us doing indoor indoor collections, again, you can spend weeks and weeks of collection going through thousands and thousands of houses. And if you're lucky, you'll get two samples. Um, and and if, if your question are specifically if there's indoor resting and, and transmission going on, then you will have an answer. However, if you wanna base it on a, on a surveillance program, uh, then you probably want to do multiple collection methods, not just one, if you want to look into the different species that you have and so forth. So in South Africa, we have um, low malaria transmission. So for us, um, it's more productive to actually sample outdoor resting mosquitoes. Again, if we sample from cattle crawls, then you would automatically get a higher cow blood index, for instance, in those samples because your collection methods were in a cattle crawl or a cattle we, we cattle are kept. Um, and, and if you have an area where there's really low number of mosquitoes, you can't go out and just put one trap out. I think you're going to be successful in answering all your questions. Um, and that's part of the challenges of working in a field. If, if you start off on a, on a field site, you need to get to know your sentinel site um, and then from there develop something that's operational and that's workable for you. So, so for us, we sometimes collect over say 150 traps and we clear them every two days, but it's in one sentinel site. It's a lot of work. You need to start early. So entomologist part of the problem is it's not office hours. So if you're not in the field by five, you've missed the boat. So, um, and I think that's, it's easy working in the lab because it's office hours, you've got air conditioning and no sun burning you, et cetera. Um, so I think you'd really, if you want the answer for whatever question you have, make sure that your surveillance technique that's out there are suitable for, for whatever question you want to answer. And, and what works in West, West Africa won't work in Southern Africa, for instance. 
So you need to go through these methods and identify one that works for you as a country or as a site where you work, your field site. And it comes with trial and, trial and error, pain and error. And, and it's also good to have people who's worked in that area that really helps to, to have that body of knowledge available either in the country or in the institute you work. Um, because those people normally know where to go and how to, how to go about. Um, so that would be my idea for surveillance, um, because then you can really dive in and um, understand what's driving your malaria. So for South Africa, our infections we got in, in species from Edenai and, and Perensis, we were able to identify that, but we had a very huge field site set up and intense surveillance went on um, throughout the year. Um, more difficult over December, um, because people also need leave. Um, but for entomologists, again, um, in South Africa, that's our summer season. Um, it's where we collect a lot of mosquitoes. So you can't necessarily have leave in December and you might have your leave in June or July. Um, so take these things into consideration. And I, I'm sure then um, if you have a specific question, you'll be able to, to identify the methods to use, whether um, it's outdoor resting, whether you use pots like we do in South Africa. I know CDC light traps are very successful in other parts of Africa. Um, larval collections, again, for us in South Africa or Southern Africa, looking for finestas, group larvae or finestas, um, is a lot of effort with very little rewards. And then you have to make a decision where you're going to put your effort and your money at the end of the day, because your field teams are normally relatively small. Um, they do get exhausted. They don't necessarily understand why you are so passionate when you get one mosquito and, you know, it's very exciting for them. You know, they might not share your, your compassion. So all these things you need to take into consideration when you do this. You know, that would be my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. So the question is important. Back to you, Fredros. Yeah. Can we now look at simian malaria? Hey. Yes, uh, and, and uh, Professor Lizette, we, we, we have some two questions on, on your, the work you guys did on Anopheles parensis and Anopheles venedine. That's going to come up just before we close, that we are nearing the end. But we will interrupt here to talk about Anoph uh, uh, Plasmodium nolisei. And then, if you don't mind staying with us, we have some questions about Anopheles parensis and, and, and venedine uh, uh, um, uh, as in their role in malaria transmission. So. Uh, Professor Indra, uh, Shell and myself have compiled a number of questions here, and we spoke to you earlier. We're very appreciative of that. So, um, unfortunately, that, that that conversation was not uploaded. We will upload it, but it would be nice to have uh, 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 additional conversations, a little bit about PK, Plasmodium nolisei, and other simian malarias. Very, very quickly, this was the first description in 2004. Uh, by uh, a group both from Malaysia and, and, and London School uh, describing the first naturally acquired P. nolisei. Uh, Indra, talk to us very, very briefly on what was the understanding at this time about PK? Was it considered uh, uh, human malaria? It, it appears, was it considered important? It appears from reading these papers that you know, people are looking for P. malaria instead, and then and they find this thing. So talk to us very briefly about the happenings in Kapit, which I believe were the first ones. There is one record about a US soldier that already had P. nolisei much earlier, 1960s, but I think this was the first description of natural occurrences. We might be wrong. So please talk to us a little yeah. bit about that, uh, Indra. Yeah, you're correct, um, Fred, because in 1965, when they found the first case, there was a lot of work that was done and then they didn't find any other case and they found that the mosquito vector was biting only monkeys and so at that time they made the assumption or they made the prediction that um, simian malaria will remain with the monkeys and or human malaria will remain with the humans. So this paper in 2004 was a breakthrough where they reported a large number of plasmodium non cases occurring and this was also using molecular techniques. So originally it was thought to be P. malari, but using molecular techniques, they found that it's actually plasmodium nolisei. So since then, y'all, I'm sure most of you are aware that 
Uh, all countries in Southeast Asia have reported uh, Plasmodium nolesi, and it's only Malaysia that has reported the most number of cases because I think we are, are seriously looking out for it. There's a lot of work being done in Sabah, Sarawak, and now in Peninsula, Malaysia. And we have also found that besides uh, Plasmodium nolesi, we are also seeing cases of Plasmodium cyanomogai and recently of Plasmodium inuai. So we feel that uh, of course, Plasmodium nolesi is now as uh, taken as some of them say that it is the fifth human malaria parasite. But for malaria elimination, Plasmodium nolesi is not taken into account. So as long as the countries can eliminate human malaria, they can get their status. That's what WHO thinks. So we are actually advocating that we would, um, we feel that Plasmodium nolesi and other simian malaria should be tackled because what is happening is that it is actually happening as like residual malaria. So what, how are we going to control this? So that is our big um, a problem yeah. that we are facing because we really do not know what tools we can use. Uh, before, before, before we talk control, can you just, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, before you talk control, which are the vectors uh, of okay. simian of, the, of plasmodium the vectors, nolesi? The vectors for Plasmodium nolesi and other simian malaria parasites are the Anopheles leucosvirus group of mosquitoes. Okay, so these are the mosquitoes that have got um, a white, um, a white, a strong white band on the tibiotarsal joint. So the leucosvirus group of mosquitoes, again, you need to identify them using molecular techniques. If you're just going to identify them by morphology, it can be way out. It can be wrong. Okay, because we have the dirus complex, the leucosvirus complex, the hackeri, uh, and hackeri and repairis. So these are the four that comes within the leucosvirus group. And the main mosquitoes uh, vectors actually belong to the dirus and to the leucosvirus group. And in uh, Vietnam, they have found in Anopheles dirus, they have found falciparum along with Plasmodium nolesi. So the, and they have been, done some molecular studies and the Vietnamese uh, authors, they feel that the mosquitoes actually picked up both the parasites from the human. They don't think that this individual mosquito bit human and then bit monkey to get both the parasite. That is their, um, their, um, outcome of their study in that paper. But so far for us, we have not found Plasmodium falciparum along with the other simian malaria parasites. We mainly find uh, all the simian malaria parasites in the vectors. Once in a way, we get uh, Plasmodium vivax, but then when it comes to vivax, the primers that we use sometimes do react. So people will get positive. So we really don't pay much attention when we get vivax in our mosquitoes. And one of the things that we are looking now at is that we want to study the parasites from the mosquito, the macaques, and the human, so that we can see molecularly, we want to see how closely related they are to show that perhaps there is human to human transmission. Because yeah. WHO's concern now is that they feel that uh, there is no human to human transmission. And so that is why they don't want to, uh, they're not taking Plasmodium nolesi into consideration when they talk about elimination. How important is uh, human, in, in, in your analysis, and in this, um, in this um, paper here, the UK have described a lot the interaction between humans and the and the ecosystem, the forest encroachment yeah. and all that, yeah. and and um, even a, a more detailed analysis, a more recent one by by you and colleagues here, uh, looking at environmental risk factors. Talk to us about this. What are the main risk factors uh, of of this transmission? Something that appears to have been there before, but is only now being seen in humans. What what exactly is happening? I think we, have, we feel that along with deforestation, so these monkeys must have been in the deep forest. So along with when deforestation has taken place, these monkeys 
my cats have traveled towards the periphery. And when they travel towards the periphery, we also feel that the mosquitoes have followed these macaques, especially in Peninsula Malaysia. Because if you know in Sabah and Sarawak, that's in Malaysian Borneo, uh, plus uh, Anopheles balabasensis and Anopheles latens have also been the primary vector for human malaria. And we also find them to be the primary vector for simian malaria. So they have always been there. But in Peninsula Malaysia, we feel that with uh, deforestation, we are finding more and more uh, vectors of the leukos virus group compared to our human malaria vectors. So of course, we feel deforestation has played a major role in, um, in the prevalence of simian malaria in humans. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, Shayla, please. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, so, Professor Indra, how is, is, is there human to human oh, transmission? And how do we actually know that it is? How do we measure that? Hello, hey, hey Jonas, I'm unable to mute you and remove you from the call. Give me guys, I have to remove this. Okay, I was unable to mute him, so just remove him. I'm sorry okay. about that. Uh, why they say that there is no human to human transmission is because they don't see clustering of cases. Though there are one or two cases where we feel that because children were in, infected in a family, so we, they feel that that could have been human to human. But because there is no large clustering, there are not many pockets of clusters of um, simian malaria or plasmodium nullicide. So that is why they feel that there is no human to human transmission taking place. Okay, so how, how do we measure this? How do we measure transmission for human, from human to human if there is? That, that is why I said that the only way perhaps we can see is to, if we can look at the parasites molecularly from the monkey, the human, and the mosquitoes, and see whether there is some kind of an, a relationship between this. Like what was done in uh, Vietnam. I do not know how many of them still accept that paper. But when I looked at it, I felt that the authors have got um, some evidence to show that human to human transmission is taking place in that area in Vietnam. Because the mosquito was present for both falciparum and nolisai. And they did some molecular studies to it to show that there is some evidence that uh, it is linked. Great, thank you. Fred Ross? Um, thank you. Indra, is that the monkey? I know you have showed this before. You wouldn't uh, <laughs> believe it. This long tail macaques, when we first started working in, um, in Pahang, mm -hmm. we actually used to see a large number of these macaques, even in quite semi urban areas. But surprisingly, when we worked in uh, Sabah, we used to get a lot of mosquitoes and they will be positive, but we had to like look out for the macaques. It was not easily visible. I don't know why. Okay. Okay, okay. And, and that's, that's a, a, a clearer picture of the macaque. Um, uh, Shayla, back to you. Hello, Shayna. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, it's the, that question, the one that we have now is still related to the one that I asked previously, but maybe just a different way of asking it. So in terms of measuring trans, uh, transmission, when we are looking at it from the entomological standpoint, 
how do we like what what are some of the indicators that we should be looking at um at the moment of course uh we the, our earlier studies we were able to use uh monkey beta traps and we were able to set them uh at different levels in platforms so we had platforms built at ground level at three feet and at six feet and uh, we used to, we had a monkey bit, we had two monkeys in each of those platforms and we covered with the mosquito net. And then we had, of course, the human landing collection. So the monkey platform, we only, we only visit the platform uh, at, at intervals, about, I think about um, at 9, 12, 3 and 5 a.m. And we will collect the mosquitoes at those, at the mosquitoes there. So we were actually comparing uh, what is the preference of the biting of the mosquitoes? Do they bite macaques at what time? And is it they, do they bite early in the night or do they bite late at night? And what we found was that um, towards the later part of the night, the macaques, were, the, the mosquitoes were more attracted to the monkeys. So, and they would bite at uh, higher levels compared to ground level. Whereas in the early part of the night, they were fighting, they were biting more, they were biting humans, of course, and um, the macaque at ground level. So this we were able to do for two study sites, one in Kapit when we first started, and the second in Pahang. After that, we are not able, now they say we cannot touch the monkey, so we are not able to, to study the, the preference of the mosquitoes to the monkeys. And so that is why we now started to actually look to do blood meal analysis. And then we have run into problems because um, we are, the, the mosquitoes are not attracted to the light traps. We were not able to collect resting mosquitoes using suction apparatus or, or nets. We do not know where the mosquitoes are resting. Because in Sabah, actually, a lot of, uh, there was a master student from London School who spent three months to do her project to study blood, uh, mosquitoes using the blood meal analysis, but she was hardly able to get, I think she only got one single Anopheles mosquito throughout her study. So you see, that's the problem that we face. So uh, anyway, now we have uh, used the mosquito magnet. We are able to get some mosquitoes coming to the mosquito magnet. And uh, there's another process that we have also used and soon we shall be publishing a paper where we have done um, some studies on the blood meal analysis of the mosquitoes. So we do find that this vector mosquitoes are also feeding on the monkeys. Yeah, you just pasted there the, the slide on your work with the mosquito magnet. Yeah. Um, uh, just in case that, that, that helps. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sheila, if you don't mind, I just want to interrupt real quick here. Indra, what is next for P Nolisai? Will Malaysia be cleared malaria free or is this going to delay things? I, I have no idea actually because they were supposed to get their malaria free status last year, 2020. But then because of COVID, everything got held up. So I do not know what is the situation. Now, what is happening? I have no idea. Okay. Back to you, Sheila. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Uh, Professor Lizetti, back to you. Um, so the situation in South, in, in South Africa is, is really quite in interesting. And especially when we are talking about um, residual transmission after indoor residual spraying. Could you please talk to us a little bit about this and especially focusing on anopheles parenthesis? Yeah, so these were interesting studies um, that we found. And I think I must give you some background again on the way these um, study sites are and what was happening in the environment. So when we found these positive samples, um, South Africa were going through a severe drought. Um, some of the parts of South Africa are currently still under, under drought and some areas um, haven't had rain in the past six or very few um, low number of rain compared to, to what's normal. So South Africa goes through drought seasons um, quite regularly. 
um, a drought season can last up to eight years and then it returns to back to normality. Um, and these were, were traps that we had up because South Africa is involved in a sterile insect technique project. It's a research project at this point that we based that. But of course, for, for that, we had to set up uh, intense um, surveillance sites so that we can monitor our mosquito populations before and after interventions. That was the plan. So um, these are both publications from, from our one PhD student. She's graduated since. And we collected samples, and we have in the past as well, collected mosquito samples, and we've done ELISAs on them to determine if they infected with, with a Plasmodium falciparum parasite. We don't really screen for the, for the other parasites. Again, it's costly, and um, there's no reason at this point to, to validate the cost for us, so we focused all our energy on, on falciparum. And we found um, mosquitoes infected on the ELISA. So of course the ELISA, and this is also work that's been done in the past, where we know there's false positivity. And, and in the past, we found this quite regularly with zoophilic species. So these are species that we know and are known to mainly feed on animals. And of course, then um, subsequent, there was a, a a heat inactivation protocol that were developed by Donuts, I think is the, is the author. I'm sure I pronounced the name wrong. And of course, then you boil yes. your ELISA step. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then you repeat your ELISA and it should be positive on both assays. So what we've done here, of course, we found the positivity and um, what does this mean? Because we know these species, although they are attracted to humans, if we do human landing catches, um, they will come to humans, um, but we've never found them infected in the field in the past. And we screened in my PhD, I, when I was a bit younger than now, I'm still young, I screened a few thousand specimens, four or five thousand, if not more. Um, and we found these false positives, but we could never confirm them with PCR, so you actually never know. So what's unique with these, we did exactly the same, did a PCR after the ELISAs and we found them to be positive. So, and, and these collections happen relatively close to each other. Um, and you can see from the, the, the sample sizes collected in these papers, it's still relatively low, but it gives a high infection rate for South Africa, even higher than Anopheles tarabiensis at, at this particular field site. And it, it brings around the question, what does this mean? Um, is the secondary vectors, um, and, and to actually classify a secondary vectors, uh, my personal opinion is you need to have some sort of idea what the contribution are for malaria, to malaria and to transmission in your area. Um, so we've, we've subsequently done a lot of samples to actually do um, blunt, um, host blood meal identifications. And, and it's very difficult to separate if these mosquitoes accidentally had a blood meal because of the drought. So some of the subsistence farming communities would have moved their cattle and their livestock. Some of them would have died. So there's fewer livestock available in the area. And of course, hindsight comes too late. Um, so some of these samples we had um, collected and, and we had them preserved, we could go back and identify blood meals where we could, but the sample sizes were low. And, and in hindsight, what we should have done is put a lot more effort into what did these mosquitoes feed on and if the drought changed their behavior somehow, so they fed on humans maybe more regularly than animals. So when this surveillance happened, we, we didn't think and the, the project wasn't designed to actually answer that question. Um, so subsequently we've gone back, but of course that now the rainfall have returned to South Africa. Um, we had proper rains um, for a number of two years, three years now. Um, so we'll continue to look for it. Um, and it's very difficult, I think, to then determine what is the, the importance of, of finding sort of zoophilic species, but yet if they were infected, we can assume that if they then get into contact with humans, they can actually feed again. And what we know from Perensis, also a study we've done in collaboration with, with people from Kenya, is that if your environment outside is hot and warm, 
um, we found parenthesis resting indoors in houses quite readily. And this was on sprayed walls. So we know that they are resistant to the insecticides. And, and does that automatically then give them an opportunity to feed easier and more often on humans? And that we actually can't put a pin on the wall and say, yes, this is what's happening. So it's ongoing work. But I think if you go for malaria elimination, you need to have answers to these things. You need to know how much does each species contribute to your malaria transmission? And that will give you an indication how much effort you need to put in. And again, like we heard from the Venezuela story, you need to go in with big guns if you want to do elimination. Um, so, and having this information is vital because then you know how much effort is needed to go from a control intervention to, to elimination at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun doing this and it's the first time in South Africa we've done it, but it's also the first time in South Africa we, we had a field site where we've put so much effort and energy into one sentinel site. And, and my personal opinion, I think that was key in identifying these, these drivers of, of potential malaria in South Africa. And I think if we've done spot collections between South Africa as a relative big country, so doing collections in our malaria provinces and you do one day here, one day there, I think it's very easy to miss if there is low infection and a low number of mosquitoes. So you collect one day, but the infected mosquito is not there. Um, and it takes you a while to get back to the same site. Um, so that's why understanding what questions you want to answer, I think is critical. And this, of course, we have now more answers and the design of this wasn't set up for that. So we, we've missed an opportunity. We had some adults and we're doing black meals, but it's going to give us limited answers, I think. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, um, Professor Lizetti. Uh, since we are running out of time, um, we are just going uh, to have- Shall I just one, one last uh, quick question before we round up? Okay. Yeah, um, Lizette, this is for you uh, and Sylvie, actually. Uh, Sylvie, it's been a while since we heard from you. Uh, we will skip, as Shella says, we'll skip up, uh, some of the questions we had, but uh, Lizette, first of all, on behalf of my colleagues and Shayla here, uh, we would like to say a big, big thank you to you and to your colleagues for the work on Anophilus Finestas, um, the systematics, the molecular identification, um, I suspect that uh, it's not this specific paper, it's a different paper, but uh, uh, your uh, molecular identification of Anopheles finestas has been super useful uh, for people working in the continent. So we will not ask questions on that specific one, uh, but um, um, I believe, I hope that colleagues on the call agree with me uh, that, uh, uh, let me actually just see if we have, if we have that specific, um, uh, paper that we're talking about here, yeah, this one, that one there. I, I believe that my colleagues on the line agree that this work has made a lot of improvement um, uh, for people working on an office semester. So thank you, thank you so, so much about about uh, for this. And it's many years since you did it, but we can still say congratulations um, and we appreciate that. One minor question around this subject that goes to you and, and, and Sylvie before we round off, I know we have only one minute or so, is it appears from your readings that Anopheles funestus and Anopheles minimus are pretty much the same thing. Um, maybe we start with Sylvie very briefly. Um, I mean, in your writings, you talk about them separated purely by geography, otherwise they are the same species. Are we mis- <laughs> Are we uh, mis misinterpreting the science here, or is that true? No, no, it's totally true. In fact, uh, they, they, they had uh, Finestus and, uh, and the Minimus uh, had um, common uh, ancestor. And uh, actually, when uh, we compared the um, uh, sequences uh, of the IETS2 and, uh, and uh, different uh, sequ gene sequences, we found that Minimus um, um, and, and Anopheles listen, listeni, listeni, uh, which is in uh, the Finestus group, but listeni being in Africa is 
closer to uh, Anopheles minimus in Asia than, uh, than uh, Funestus being in Africa. I don't know if I'm very clear, but uh, I, I make it clear, I think, I hope. <laughs> um, Anopheles lysani is uh, in Africa. And when we compare the, the sequence of the ITS2 of Anopheles lysani compared to Anopheles minimus being only in Asia, they are very close to each other. Now, if we compare the, the, the ITS2 sequence of lysani and Anopheles finestus both being in Africa, they are uh, far apart. So uh, that was the PhD work of uh, Claire Garros. Uh, she, uh, uh, with uh, Lisette and, and uh, Maureen uh, Kodzi, we, uh, we gathered species from Africa and uh, species from Asia, and we compared all these species. And, uh, and it's how we found that they, they, they had a common uh, uh, ancestor. Uh, that uh, and with time, um, the the and will uh, change in the environment. Uh, th there was a, a separation between Africa and Asia, with the desertification of the uh, Arabic uh, corridor. The species were not linked anymore, so uh, no no more uh, gene. Uh, um, uh, link between these two and the separation and, and speciation process between these, uh, these species. But it was very interesting the, to, to find out that uh, uh, the, there is a common uh, uh, gene basis bit, uh, with, uh, between uh, Asian and um, African Anopheles mosquitoes within the Funestus group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any comments on that? Yes, I can only agree. If you look at the larvae of, of Lisa and I, it looks totally different to the Finesta subgroup. I can also tell you if you want to rear Lisa and I in the lab, you need to um, have, like we say, hair on your teeth because you will walk into the insect tree. They'll be very happy. You will go home, have a nap. You come back the next morning, they're all dead. So it's, it's one of the, the species that I found really difficult to rear through successfully. Um, in our hands um, in the lab. So they're definitely different to, to Finestas as a species. The eggs look different, um, larvae look different. Um, so really interesting how they ended up, or well, that species didn't, I, like Sylvie said, it's probably when the continent split up. That's how old these um, deviations are. And, and another interesting thing, if you look at the immunology, for instance, on Finestas, it's closer to Stevens eye than it is to the Gamby complex. So there's some duplications of genes that you find in Stevens eye, um, and yet Gamby complex don't have them. So definitely these species are interlinked ancestrally somewhere way back. Um, so really interesting to, to look at, at these species, yeah. No, thank you, thank you guys so, so much. Uh, uh, thanks all, I return this to Sheila for roundup. Sheila, please. Um, so I think to our panelists, we'd just like to hear from you one last word or opinion or advice regarding um, the topic that we handled today. Uh, we can start with you, Professor Lizetti, and then move on to that. Professor Lizetti, please. Hi, Sheila. So all I can say is thank you to you and Fredros for putting this together. Um, and it was really good for me to listen to, to the Asian side and the American side of these mosquitoes because we tend to live in our own little bubble. So it's really good having people together talking about sometimes similar things and sometimes different things. So thank you for that. I think it was a very good and informative um, thing. And I definitely learned a lot. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sylvie. Um, so you you would like to um, uh, you had a specific question about uh, uh, careers or mentorship or the last part of your or, or you you don't want to um, 
to uh, Be because of time we're yes, keeping that, but feel free <laughs> no because no that, yeah. it's just because we are four women please, here yeah and it is <laughs> so great yeah, yeah. To, uh, to have women uh, all together showing that we can uh, have uh, uh, we can be passionate for the for this topic and um and really vector vector control and um, um, uh, medical entomology needs um, more uh, more people, um, more women, if uh, women are attracted to, to this field and they are most welcome because uh, I think they can do a great job. And uh, I think the, we are a little bit uh, an example, uh, if I could say, <laughs> very, very humble, but uh, yeah, there, there are women uh, doing great job in a different continent, uh, as you can say, uh, as you can see. And um, of course, I love this masterclass. I try to to be uh, to listen to uh, all the, the different uh, topics uh, each time. And uh, and Fred and Sheila, really, you do a wonderful uh, job. And uh, really, many, many, many thanks. Looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Sylvie. Please, Professor Indra. Oh, first, I must congratulate uh, Sheila and Fred because I think you all really do a marvellous job. It's not easy to run a masterclass like this every week. You know, you have so much to prepare. So I really must congratulate you both. And I hope that others will follow and stimulate and, you know, do what you all are doing. And of course, if you want to work on as an entomologist, I think you need to be very passionate and you must be prepared to go out to the field and work. As you have seen so many ladies out in the field, I wish that there are so many men out there, but perhaps some of them don't want to go to the field. I don't know. Now we have more ladies, perhaps. Perhaps the women power has shown the way. I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, well done. And I really enjoy your class. I always follow your class every week if I can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Indra. Uh, Professor Yasmin, please. Well, I think I don't have any much to say. I mean, everything has been said before. I do agree with what Lee said, Indra, and Sylvie has said. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for the, for the invitation and for running these excellent master classes with, through the pandemic had been kind of oxygen and getting together and happen to re-encounter all friends from long time ago. And just to thank you, and I do agree with Sylvie, so I do acknowledge you, Sheila and Fred for the tremendous effort you are putting in, in organizing these master classes and go and taking the trouble of revising, revising the publication of your invited speakers. So, that's a tremendous effort and I do, I do appreciate what you are doing, not only for people like me, but also for the young people, the new the generation that is coming behind that can learn from firsthand information what is going on around the world. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Back to you, Fred Ross. No, really, really uh, kind messages. Thank you guys so much for your kind words. Um, and thanks also for the messages about uh, uh, the women entomologists. I, I noticed that uh, Damaris, Damaris is still with us, I hope. Damaris, are you still with us, I hope? Just said, put a chat there, yes or no? Yes, I'm here. Um, yeah, actually, you must have been very happy listening to this. So, so I'm gonna give you one second for that, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We keep on saying that um, actually we don't have women entomologists and I'm so happy to see you, all of you here, uh, are excited that uh, we have women entomologists who've done excellent job and currently doing a lot of work. So looking forward, I'm going to, to request for your contacts from Fred Ross and Sheila to reach out to see how we can collaborate and work together and strengthen the work women are doing in entomology. Nice to see you, all of you, thanks. Thank you so much. And thanks to you as well, Damaris, for leading the uh, Women in Vector Control work at PAMCA. Uh, most important, really, thanks to all our experts and thanks to Shayla, uh, my colleague. Uh, Shayla, you don't get to, to be thanked, so I think I have responsibility to thank you. Thank we you. are grateful also, yes, thank you so much, Shayla. 
We are grateful also to our participants. You make you keep these master classes alive. We apologize for the situation last week, and we will try to keep the uh, uh, the messages going out as early as we can. Uh, but again, uh, uh, this is on YouTube, so kindly share with your colleagues. And whenever you get the invitations for these master classes, remember they are one one hundred percent free. So feel free to share. Uh, we are facing a little bit of a challenge on on, on sending out information. Yeah, but we will try and uh, figure that out. So this information might not have gone to as many people as we would have wished because we faced some challenges uh, last week with the calendar. Yeah, but hopefully we will resolve this. So again, thank you very, very much. This has been an incredible conversation. Thanks to Sylvie. Thanks to Yasmin. Thanks to Indra. Uh, uh, thanks to Shayla herself. And thanks to Professor Lizette. Uh, thanks also to Therapap, who unfortunately had to leave earlier uh, because of a curfew in Thailand. And thanks to um, uh, Marianne Sinka as well, who left earlier, and to everybody. We wish you a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend, and we hope to see you in the next masterclass. Bye-bye.